Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hi my name is Monica. I like to post anti-MLM, so that's anti-multi-level marketing, life, and some true crime content here on this channel. So if any of that interests you, make sure to hit that subscribe button. I would love for you to stick around. In today's video, I'm bringing you the complete Nexium series. So if you have already watched all of my Nexium videos, this is just going to be a repeat of that. I wanted to put this all into one video in case there are people out there who prefer this kind of format. So each video that I already made will be in this series and there will be timestamps in the description box below along with all of my sources. So of course, just as a disclaimer, this is just based on the research that I was able to do along with some of my opinions sprinkled in. In addition to that, there is talk of some very heavy subjects in this video such as sexual abuse and sexual assault. So I do always tell everyone to proceed with caution if that is something that you may be sensitive to. Within the video, you might hear in the different parts that I'll say, oh, I'll talk about this in a future video. It's going to be talked about in a future part within this video, because like I said, I'm just putting all of the videos into one. So the transitions might be a little bit different and a little bit odd. So I'm going to try my best to make sure that the transitions between each topic are good and kind of flow together. I guess without further ado, let's get into this entire completed Nexium series. Nexium claimed to be a multi-level marketing company that sold personal and professional development seminars of a large group awareness training that were part of their executive success programs. These executive success programs would later become what we know as Nexium today. I've done a few videos on these types of trainings and Stephen Hassan even talks about this in a post on his website. I will leave that linked below, but he says, self-help or self-development groups use self-improvement and counseling to target people and corporations, making claims that by taking their courses and seminars, you will be successful. They exercise an intense group of influence and can have major impact on their members' mental status. Members lose their personal boundaries. They put the leader or guru on a pedestal. Criticism against the leader or the group is met with resistance. These groups will often rent large hotel spaces and run workshops and seminars for many days, often 12 hours a day. These groups are also called large group awareness trainings or LGATs. They promise personal transformation but are not run by trained mental health professionals, nor are there any sufficient screening done ahead of time to determine if a person is too unstable or in too fragile a point in their lives, which is something that I have mentioned so many times when I talk about these types of large group awareness trainings and these types of gurus. This is something that I have spoken about. Very powerful hypnotic techniques are often used in these trainings, as well as powerful public confrontations using curse words and other shock techniques. If you wish to get a sense of one of the most financially successful transformational groups, look at Netflix's Tony Robbins, I Am Not Your Guru. This is something that my friend Savvy from Savvy Writes Books and I have gone over. We did we have, we've already done a few collabs about Tony Robbins. Recently, we did another one where Savvy did this really great animation of, we decided to start calling him Tiny Ribbons, and there's a bouncy castle involved, also talking about how Tony Robbins is a 15-year-old. Just watch that video. I'll leave it linked below because I think that that's a really interesting video that we went over along with some other problematic things that Tony has done. But anyway... Robbins is trained in Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP, and he well knows the power of hypnotic words. Don't think of a white horse and you think of one. I am not your guru, and guess what? The second generation Children of God woman he says this to in the documentary later tells her he will mentor her. It was so upsetting for me to watch. Going back to Nexium though, there were more sinister things happening within Nexium. This MLM company was actually a cult based out of Clifton Park, New York that was involved in sex trafficking. They had been recruiting for a secret society called DOS, and DOS stands for a Latin phrase that translates to master over slave women. These women were branded and forced into sexual slavery. 
Within DOS, some of the women were on restrictive diets where they could only have 800 calories or less, which was one way to be able to control these women. 1998 is the year Nexium was founded by Keith Rainier and Nancy Salzman. During the ESP seminars, the students were supposed to call Keith Vanguard and Nancy Prefect. According to The Hollywood Reporter, they said that Keith Rainier got the idea for the name Vanguard from a favorite arcade game. Rick Ross, who has been a cult tracker for decades, he's also been used as a consultant by the federal government. When he sat down with ex-members of Nexium, he determined that Keith is a cult leader. According to Rick Ross, quote, In my opinion, Nexium is one of the most extreme groups I have ever dealt with in the sense of how tightly wound it is around the leader, Keith Rainier, end quote. Rick even compared Keith to David Koresh, who was the leader of the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. If that is something you'd like me to look into and cover, let me know in the comment section below. Rick Ross does believe after having two mental health professionals look at Nexium that the followers were going through something called thought reform or in other words, what some people call this is brainwashing along with independent thinking being non-existent. Let's take a look at Keith Rainier, where he came from, how did he evolve into this type of a person and just some things about Keith Rainier. So Keith was born on August 26, 1960 to James Rainier and Vera Oshipko. James was an advertiser in New York City while Vera was a ballroom dancing instructor. Vera was described by Keith as an alcoholic and when he was eight, his parents did separate. When Keith was about 12, he read the book Second Foundation, which is a book about mind control and he would later go on to say that this inspired him for with Nexium. There have been stories told by families and friends that Keith allegedly had this type of complex as soon as he was told that he was talented and intelligent. Basically, he was a little full of himself, in my opinion, and he thought of himself as some kind of god or just a higher power. Allegedly, when he was in his teen years, he also had a way with girls by telling all of them that they were special and the only loves of his life. I would say he started his manipulating ways when he was a child. He went to a public school until he was in high school, which is when he transferred to Rockland County Day School. Keith graduated in June of 1978 and he did go on to further his education, but he graduated with a 2.2 26 GPA and barely passed many of the advanced courses that he was constantly bragging and telling people about to, I guess, in my opinion, make him feel better about himself. At 24 years old, Keith had met a 15 year old. Some have reported 12 years old, but the common age that I have been seeing is 15. he ended up raping her. In 1984, Keith had manipulated, at the time, 15-year-old Gina Melita to be in a relationship with him. In 2012, she told the Albany Times Union, quote, I was perfect picking, insecure at the time. To have someone that mature and that well thought of to be interested in me, it was flattering. I was young, inexperienced, overwhelmed, out of my league, end quote. Then there was 15-year-old Gina Hutchinson. Keith claimed that Gina's soul was much older than her biological age. She was a Buddhist goddess meant to be with him. As of the current laws, anyone who is older than the age of 18 in the state of New York cannot have sex with anyone under 17 years of age. Even if it's consensual, this person has committed statutory rape. Gina Hutchinson would drop out of school to continue her relationship with Keith and she would work at his company called Consumers Byline, which we'll go over in a little bit. On October 11, 2002, she was found dead at the Buddhist monastery and it was ruled a suicide. This is something that we will go over in a future video. Keith was also part of the Mega Society where he achieved a high score on the test, which it was a 48 question test. The Mega Society is a high IQ society open to people who have scored at the one in a million level on a test of general intelligence claimed to be able to discriminate at that level. 
The Mega Society is basically just a high IQ society that is supposed to be for people that score one in a million on in the level of this question test. This society was founded by Ronald Hofflin in 1982 for psychometric research. While many have said that these tests have not been properly looked at, analyzed, validated, they're not of a standardized test. The Guinness Book of World Records recognized that the most elite in the high IQ society is the mega society with percentiles of 99.99 or one in a million required for admission. It's to no surprise that Keith was involved with multi-level marketing, Amway to be exact. If you don't know much about Amway, they are the, I guess you could say the OGs of the MLM industry. A lot of things have happened thanks to Amway. They also have plenty of ties with the US government. I've also seen people comment that they have a lot of ties with other types of other countries and their government. So that's something that I'll probably look into a little bit further. I did do a deep dive on Amway. Over, I want to say it's over a year ago now. But if you want a lot of great content on Amway, I'll leave a channel link below. It's Zay and Melody. So I highly recommend checking them out. It's been said that Keith was very fascinated by Amway, Scientology, and neurolinguistic programming. I spoke about this a little bit earlier in the video, but according to Wikipedia, NLP is pseudoscientific approach to communication, personal development, and psychotherapy created by Richard Bandler and John Grinder in California in the 1970s. NLP's creator claimed there is a connection between neurological processes, language, and behavioral patterns learned through experience, and that these can be changed to achieve specific goals in life. The creators have claimed that NLP can treat things such as phobias, depression, tic disorders, psychosomatic illnesses, allergies, the common cold, and even learning disorders. NLP has been used by hypnotherapists and companies that run leadership training for businesses and government agencies. Even with all of that, there's still no scientific evidence, which is why they have been deemed a pseudoscience. Before Keith created his own MLM, he did work as a computer programmer for New York State's Division of Parole. He founded his own MLM called Consumers Byline Incorporated by 1990. This company promoted discounts on things such as groceries, appliances, things of that nature. According to Forbes, Keith had recruited members for this company by promising them massive commissions by recruiting more people. Within a couple of years, they had employed 150 people and eventually had over 200,000 members. The top seller for this company was someone by the name of Tony Natalie, along with her husband at the time. Her and her son would move to Clifton Park to be closer to Keith and her marriage would end shortly after that. Tony and Keith would go on to date for the next eight years. By the end of 1993, it was reported that each recruit had to pay $19 per month and there was $1 billion sold in goods and services. However, this was also the same year that the company would be investigated for being an alleged pyramid scheme. Which is why I always tell my audience and MLM reps that the argument of pyramid schemes are illegal, so an MLM can't be one. It's just not a good argument because yes, it is true that pyramid schemes are illegal, but that doesn't mean the MLM isn't operating as such. Some of them are operating as a legal MLM, but even legal MLMs is something that I have an issue with, so I do apologize, but that is something that I'm going to be biased about but it doesn't make the company any less unethical just because it is legal. In 1996 is when Consumers Byline was shut down. There were 25 investigations that were looking into Consumers Byline. Keith never admitted to any wrongdoing, but he did have to pay $40,000 after shutting down and he had to sign a consent order with the New York State Attorney General's office that banned him from promoting offering or granting participation in a chain distribution scheme. While all of this was going on, in 1994, Keith has started another MLM called National Health Network. This was a company that sold vitamins. However, this company would also fail. But if we fast forward to the year 1997, Keith met a woman who would eventually become his business partner later down the line. 
Her name was Nancy Salzman. Going back to the NLP thing, Nancy was a therapist who studied NLP and hypnosis. She had gone through a really tough time and Keith had somehow helped her and became somewhat of a spiritual guide for her. Nancy would then in turn treat Tony with therapy and decided to lend her $50,000 for a health food business. In 1999, when the health food store went under, there was a bankruptcy court battle and Keith sided with Nancy during this. Tony ended up moving away and court records show that Keith was sending her different verses and stuff like that. In my opinion, I think that he was harassing her and I think that this was definitely a scary time for her because it was putting her in a dangerous situation, but he even drew a diagram for her showing that she was in danger of going down a dream death line. There was a testimony that talked about how Keith had sent police to Tony's mother's house along with threatening her and her family. Keith appealed this several times and Tony would later go on to say, quote, I can't think, I can't work, I can't pay my bills, end quote. Along with calling Keith a compulsive gambler and a sex addict who had bizarre desires and he was basically just a con man who specialized in Ponzi schemes. Judging by what we know about Keith, I would be absolutely shocked if he didn't threaten Tony. Before we keep going, let's talk about Keith's number two, Nancy Salzman and her daughter, Lauren Salzman. Nancy was born on July 16th, 1954 in New York. I will say that there was only one source that I could find that said that this was her birthday, but a lot of other sources don't know the actual date. They just keep putting 1954. So take that date with a grain of salt. She graduated from Muhlenberg College in Allentown, PA. She married her now ex-husband, Michael Salzman, and they had two daughters. Some reports have said that they only had one daughter, but I'm not sure if maybe they're trying to keep the other daughter out of the spotlight or what the case may be, but they have two daughters. In the late 1970s is when Nancy started working as a nurse and therapist who studied NLP and hypnosis. In addition, she worked under human empowerment and human potential fields. The therapy skills that she acquired would be used on future victims of Nexium. However, there was an article that I found that said Nancy may not have been truthful about her credentials, allegedly. This next portion is all allegedly, but I do think that it's a good point to bring up in case you do want to look into this a little bit further because this is something that I haven't really seen be talked about. But there was an article that talked about how Nancy Salzman might not have a bachelor's in nursing. She had more than one bachelor's degree while pursuing nursing, but not an actual nursing degree. She also attended a hospital nursing program that would lead to becoming an RN, but not having a bachelor's degree. The college that she did go to is a liberal arts college that this person said didn't even offer a nursing degree. Whether these allegations are just that, allegations or true, I can't really confirm that. What's so sad is Nancy brought her daughter, Lauren Salzman, into Nexium. Lauren first met Keith when she was 21 years old in 1998. They started to have a sexual relationship in 2001 and they would keep this a secret until about 2008, 2009. Lauren would eventually become the first line master of DOS, which is what I spoke about earlier in this video. Lauren was not just a member of this cult, but she was very sought after because she was a coach and she was higher ranking. She was part of this secret society that they had within Nexium. Later on in her testimony, she would say, quote, he was my master. I respected him and trusted him and I wanted to be like him because I was sad and suffering, end quote. Lauren called Keith Doomp and he called her Lorne or Forlorn. When Lauren would start climbing the ranks, so to speak, within Nexium, Keith would tell her to have sex with other women that he was having sex with, but she wasn't allowed to have sex with other men, just with Keith. He would hold having a child over her head. She asked him for permission to date another man and he said that if she stuck around, he would give her children. Lauren was involved in keeping a woman who was from Mexico, Danny, in confinement with no communication with the outside world because Danny had fallen in love with another man that was not Keith. 
this woman was told that if she didn't agree to stay in confinement, she would have to go back to Mexico. According to Lauren's testimony, this woman stayed in confinement between 18 to 24 months. Danny would write letters to Keith that Lauren would deliver. They were apology letters and Keith even told Danny's mother to stay confined in a room that was right next to hers as a way to manipulate Danny and make it seem like it was her fault that her own mother was also in confinement. Danny finally left in February of 2012 where she was driven to the Mexican border by her father and another member from Nexium. They refused to give Danny her immigration papers back. In Lauren's future testimony, she would say, quote, of all things I did in this case and all the crimes that were committed, this was the worst thing I did, end quote. And this was said while she was talking about Danny. Lauren did all of this still hoping that Keith would have a child with her. There is more to be discussed about Lauren, but that is going to be saved for a future video. By 2003, 3,700 people had taken these classes. Some of these included Edgar Brofman Sr., Linda Evans, Grace Park, Nikki Klein, who later married Allison Mack in 2017, and in the early 2000s, Seagram, heiresses Claire and Sarah, the daughters of Edgar, became part of Nexium. The plot twist with Edgar Sr. is he thought it was a cult while his daughters had taken out a line of credit to pay Nexium $2 million and they hadn't spoken to their father in months at that point in 2006. Edgar was born on June 20th, 1929 in Montreal, Canada and passed on December 21st, 2013. He was a Canadian American businessman who worked for his family's businesses Seagram. He eventually became president, treasurer, and CEO, along with becoming president of the World Jewish Congress. It's been said that he helped in legitimizing the Hebrew language in Russia. As for Edgar's daughters, Sarah was introduced to Nexium in 2001 when she was 25 by a family friend. After Sarah joined, she really wanted her sister Claire to join. At the time, Claire had been a competitive jumper, horse trainer, and owner of Slate River Farm. She was described as being more of a homebody. Eventually, Sarah and Claire became very involved with Nexium and would relocate closer to the headquarters in New York. Sarah would become director of humanities, regional vice president, professional coach, and head trainer. An actress by the name of Kristen Kirk became part of Nexium in 2006. She was on the show Smallville and she joined Nexium thinking it was a self-help group, but left in 2013. Kristen stated that she didn't witness any illegal activities while she was there and actress Sarah Edmondson vouched for her because Sarah was working on exposing Nexium. Allison Mack, an actress on Smallville as well and Kristen's co-star, would be recruited by Nancy and Lauren Salzman. It wasn't until 2011 when Smallville had finished production that Allison Mack moved to Clifton Park, New York to be closer to where Nexium's headquarters were. Allison Mack was born on July 29, 1982 in West Germany. Her parents were American, but were in Germany at the time, and they lived there for about two years. After they moved back to the US, they did move to California, and Allie's first gig was a German chocolate company where she described that during the shooting process, they were shooting a commercial, she wasn't allowed to swallow the chocolate. She had to spit it out every time that she bit into it. After that, she went into modeling along with she decided to start studying acting. Allison would marry an actress by the name of Nikki Klein in February of 2017. Some have said that their marriage might have allegedly been for immigration purposes. That I don't know. I have not seen full-blown evidence of this, but that is what people have been speculating. Nikki is best known for her role in Battlestar Galactica. In 2008, she decided to leave Battlestar Galactica in order to work for Nexium full time. Allison Mack was of course part of DOS and she was responsible for the branding that happened to the women of this cult. The branding that they did were the initials of Allison Mack and Keith Rainier together.
The year was 1998. Keith Rainier and Nancy Salzman decided to start an MLM company. This wasn't Keith's first rodeo with starting a multi-level marketing company though. Although the previous ones were shut down or accused of being pyramid schemes, he just didn't really have the greatest track record. This new MLM was Executive Success Programs. These programs were supposed to be for personal development. If you're unfamiliar with the multi-level marketing industry, it is very, very highly encouraged to focus on personal development, self-help, motivational books or seminars. But I do believe the MLM industry has in a way tainted what personal development really is with how heavily they focus on that and really take it to the next extreme with toxic positivity. There's nothing wrong with being positive and having an optimistic outlook. It's when good vibes only becomes a way of life that it's toxic. My issue with personal development and MLMs besides the toxic positivity is that if you're struggling to build your business, and I use that term business very loosely, but instead of your upline giving you legitimate tools on how to grow and be successful, they'll tell you to just go read some personal development, which is why there are so many self-help gurus that thrive within the MLM industry. That's why it's no surprise that Keith would go down this route. In my opinion, I do think a lot of self-help gurus realize they can be more successful making money off of network marketing or multi-level marketing by not being really truly in it. I made a video on the TeamZ app probably about a year ago now, and that was started by previous MLMers. So I wonder if they weren't really as successful as they portrayed, but they saw they could capitalize off of the industry in another way. The reason being is because MLMers are trying to achieve this unrealistic dream. They're trying so hard to make it, and they think if they just keep going, do all the things, and take their business to the next level by paying for Team Z or by going to seminars to these self-help gurus such as Eric Worre and Tiny Ribbons or Tony Robbins, that they're going to achieve all of their goals and all of their dreams. All because if you just work your biz and keep a positive attitude, that will be what makes you successful in an MLM. Keith would go on to claim that these executive success programs, that their main emphasis is to have people experience more joy in their lives. Keith would have his students or members of these programs call him Vanguard and Nancy Salzman's title was called Prefect. This was due to Keith's favorite arcade game that was developed in 1981, where the destruction of your enemies would increase your own power. The plot of the game entailed the Gond, who had been destroying space colonies with raids of destruction. The player was to bring down the Gond, and they would be equipped with a fighter ship. If the player would not bring down their enemies, each of these colonies were subject to mass destruction by the Gond. I can see why Keith would like to be called Vanguard that held a meaning of power to him. Whereas Nancy's prefect title is a little more self-explanatory. If you don't happen to know what this term means, according to Google, the first definition says in some schools, a senior student authorized to enforce discipline, which would make sense because Nancy was Keith's first student and a co-founder of these programs. Apparently Nexium's training was subject to non-disclosure agreements. They said their training was a trade secret. If we fast forward to 2003, Nexium actually sued the Ross Institute for copyright infringement. The reasoning behind this was because Rick Ross, who I spoke about in part one and is a cult expert, got a hold of the company's manual from Stephanie Franco, an ex-member, and he went on to post this to his website. After Rick analyzed and dissected the manual, along with getting a psychiatrist involved, they called the training expensive brainwashing. Stephanie Franco was a co-defendant during this trial and she did in fact sign an NDA which states you cannot give this information to others. Stephanie Franco was a New Jersey social worker who spent a little over $2,000 plus expenses for a five-day class due to it being recommended to her. Nexium filed in both New York and New Jersey, but both were dismissed. There was an appeal and the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit did support the original dismissals because while the manual was obtained in violation of the NDA, it was still considered fair use since Rick Ross's use was a critical analysis, not a replacement for the original manual. Then we move on to the Forbes article that was published in October of 2003 about Nexium and Keith. The article was written by Michael Friedman and the title was Cult of Personality. 
According to a Vanity Fair article that was reporting on the Forbes article, they said that people at Nexium were stunned. They expected a positive story. Some of the top ranking people of Nexium that spoke to Forbes included Keith Rainier, Nancy Salzman, and Sarah Brofman. What upset them was that Edgar Brofman said that he thinks that it's a cult. If you missed part one, Edgar Brofman is the father of Sarah and Claire Brofman. If you know the company Seagram's, yep, that's theirs and Sarah and Claire are heiresses of that. Sarah and Claire did join Nexium and even had their father Edgar take a course, but he clearly was not a fan of it like his daughters were. He especially had an issue with Claire taking out a line of credit to loan Nexium $2 million. Later on in 2010, another article would come out that talked about how the Brofman sisters took advice from Keith. And unfortunately, this actually resulted in some failed real estate deals. However, let's get back to the Forbes article because there are a few things that were stated in that article that I do want to mention. Keep in mind that this article is a little over 17 years old. So of course, certain things have changed since, but they said in this article, Rainier, who has no MBA, has shrewdly cashed in on the high profit fad of executive coaching, a booming multi-billion dollar market. It includes established firms and renowned individuals who promise to help people become better executives, improve productivity, and navigate office politics. But some people see a darker and more manipulative side to Keith Rainier. Detractors say he runs a cult leg program aimed at breaking down his subjects psychologically, separating them from their families, and inducting them into a bizarre world of messianic pretensions, idiosyncratic language, and ritualistic practices. Bernier says there's nothing in his operation that makes it a cult, and indeed, many enrollees see executive success programs as a good coaching program and nothing more. Enron's Stephen Cooper put himself in this category, yet Rainier is an unlikely mentor to the wealthy and well-connected. A decade ago, he ran an alleged pyramid scheme that collapsed after signing up at least 250,000 customers and bringing in more than $33 million a year. A federal judge ruled in favor of an ex-girlfriend who was in a bitter legal fight with Rainier, citing a jilted fellow's attempt at revenge and finding that Rainier had harassed her, disrupted her business, and manipulating her into giving up her 10-year-old son to the boy's father. That woman was Tony Natalie, and she told Forbes that she believes Rainier brainwashed her, telling her she was put on this earth to carry his baby, the baby who would alter the course of history. Rainier claims that this claim is ridiculous and not very rational. Rainier has no driver's license, relying on friends for rides and walking up to 12 miles a day. He says he has no bank account and that he foregoes any salary from the $4 million a year coaching program he created. I consider everything payment for what I've done. Though he co-owns a small house near Albany, New York with a female friend, he spends most nights at one or another of three friends' homes. He claims not to own a bed. I live, he says, with a disarmingly warm smile, a somewhat church mouse type existence. Executive success resembles motivational groups such as the Landmark Forum, the Sterling Institute of Relationship and Lifespring. It is also reminiscent of the human potential training of the 1970s with a few Scientology-like elements and parallels to EST. The much criticized groupthink program founded by Werner Erhard. Unlike EST, which famously discouraged students from using the bathroom during sessions, executive success offers plenty of breaks. Students pay up to $10,000 for five days of lectures and intense emotional probing in daily 13-hour cram sessions. They remove their shoes for class, learn obscure handshakes, and wear patented colored sashes in dozens of different variations that signify rank in the organization. When a higher ranking student enters a room, they must stand to show respect. They are taught to bow to one another and to the vanguard. When he makes a rare appearance, Elvis-like, students rush up to him. Some ex-clients say they have seen him greet each woman with a kiss on the mouth, although Rainier denies this. Keith spoke very highly of himself, and I truly think he had one of the biggest egos, in my opinion. If you remember from part one, I spoke about how he had a lower GPA when he graduated, but he was part of the mega society. In this very same article, they wrote about how Keith claims he spoke in full sentences by the time he was one, and he taught himself high school math in 19 hours when he was 12 and 13. I find that really hard to believe, and I don't know if Keith actually believed all of this that he was claiming, or if he was just flat out lying to people, or maybe even a mixture of both. 
According to the Forbes article, when you go to these courses, the days start at 8 a.m. with an ESP hand clap. The students would go through sessions that included money, face of the universe, control, freedom and surrender, and more. Some of these courses lasted 17 hours a day, and because of the exhaustion, there were several people who had to be hospitalized during these sessions due to having breakdowns or psychotic episodes. They talk about how parasites are people who suffer and create problems where none exist or are craving attention. Suppressives are people who see good but want to destroy it, which means that anyone who criticized the executive success programs were suppressive people. Doesn't this kind of sound a little too familiar? Kind of like Scientology? Coaches of ESP were telling students that they should take more sessions, more than one time, which would come out to thousands of dollars. During these sessions, teachers would try to find out information about the students, such as their beliefs and backgrounds. I do think this was a way to have some kind of collateral against these members. They tried to get students to talk about their bad habits and see how it benefits their survival, then replace it with a new habit. Nexium had a 12 point mission statement where students or members would talk about purging themselves of all parasites and envy based habits. Let's take a quick look at the 12 point mission statement. Number one, success is an interior state of clear and honest awareness of who I am, my values in the world and my responsibility for the reactions I have to all things. Two, there are no ultimate victims. Therefore, I will not choose to be a victim. Three, I am committed to my success. I understand that we must all elevate ourselves and thus elevate all others just as everyone else elevates us. This is interdependence. Four, the success obtained by my own means is successful gained. True success cannot be stolen, copied, or obtained by chance. I will not appear to be successful by these means or by any other. I will earn my own success. Five, tribute is a form of payment and honor. It is to give honor to those who merit honor. I will use the tribute to praise others beyond my petty dislikes. As a result, I will define my being and my true contribution to humanity. Six, Successful people do not steal and have no desire or need to steal. I will not steal anything. I will always earn what I need and want. Copying without permission or tribute is not a compliment. It is robbery. The robbery is to take or receive anything without having earned it. It is always at the expense, however small, of others. Inner honesty and integrity are the highest human values and the foundation of human psychology. All other values emerge from them. I will never change my inner integrity or honesty for any other value, never worth it. Eight, the methods and information I learn in ESP are for my personal use only. I will not speak of them, nor will I give to others knowledge of them outside ESP. Part of being accepted into ESP is to keep all the information confidential. If I violate this commitment, I am breaking a promise and breaching my contract, but more, I am deteriorating my internal and integrated honesty. Nine, real success is never at the expense of others. As a successful individual, I will never envy someone else's success. I will rejoice because I understand that the success of others elevates me, even a little, because I am also part of the human team. The updating of human potential by anyone is a tribute to the whole humanity team. If others are successful, I will protect their success against those who envy them. I promise to free myself from all habits that are based on parasitism and envy, and replace them with habits of effort and interdependence. Ten. I will accept without reservation the success I have gained. I will accept neither more nor less. This is to accept with integrity. I will give unreservedly to those who have earned it. This is to give with integrity. I will accept with integrity as easily as I give with integrity. Not to accept what I am worth or what I have won is to devalue myself and therefore to devalue others. 11. People control the money, wealth, and resources of the world. It is essential for the survival of humanity that these things are in control of successful and ethical people. I promise to ethically control as much money, wealth, and resources of the world as possible within my plan of success. I will always support the ethical control of these things. And lastly, number 12. A world of successful people will undoubtedly be a better world. A world free from hunger, theft, dishonesty, envy, and insecurity. People will no longer try to destroy each other, steal from each other, lower each other, or rejoice at the loss of another. Success, ethics, and integrity go hand in hand. 
I promise to share and enroll people in ESP and their mission for my own benefit and to make the world a better place to live. There is a great article that will be listed within my sources link below that goes into a breakdown of each of these points. And it's a really great article. I highly recommend that you read it, but I just wanted to present them to you in this video. If we bring it back to Sarah Brofman, she started taking the classes at the end of 2002 after her marriage ended. At the time, she lived in Belgium and had a family friend recommend these courses to her. And that's when she decided to join, later becoming a full-time coach. At one point, Sarah said, quote, I don't know how much you know about my family, but coming from a family where I've never had to earn anything before in my life, it was a very, very moving experience for me to be awarded this yellow sash. It was the first thing I had earned on just my merits, end quote. Since Sarah mentioned the yellow sash in this quote, let's take a look at the sash colors and what they mean in Nexium. The color of the sashes kind of showed your rank amongst other members. Nexium isn't the only one who uses this concept though. We have martial arts that use belts, or if you remember in Tiger King, I feel like that came out ages ago, but Carol Baskin did something similar with the t-shirts of her volunteers, the color of the t-shirts. It's just a way to differentiate who's of a higher standing, whether it be based on merit, skill, or in Nexium's case, money, in my opinion. These sashes had to be ironed on a daily basis. When you first entered into this sex cult, you started off with a white sash, and this shows that you're a student. The stripe path is what they call this entire process of rank advancing. Keith was a person who decided which sash color you would receive, but most of the time it had to do with how many classes you were taking and how many people you were recruiting. In other words, it depended on how much money you were giving Nexium, allegedly, in my opinion. As I said, white sashes were for students and anyone who paid to take these classes received a white sash. It's been said that Keith wore a white sash at times because he referred to himself as a student and this was to make him seem humble or relatable to the other members. In my opinion, it was just him manipulating his members even more without them even realizing it. I'm not saying that having a leader, whether it be at work, a group, or whatever else you want to use in this example, that thinks of themselves on the same level of everyone else as manipulative. In most cases, I would say that this was almost a sign of respect for the people who weren't at the same level as these higher ups or just a way to kind of be humble or anything like that. But in this case, I think it was just a manipulative tactic on Keith's end. At the same time, at one point he said that he represented all colors, but appearing white to the naked eye. It's really just smoke and mirrors. These white scarves cost $2,000. And according to Frank Parlato, who was Nexium's publicist that later left the group and testified at the Nexium trial, said that Keith would waive the $2,000 fee for slender and attractive women. It's been said that there have been most likely more than 15,000 white ranks. White ranks would learn how to recite praises to Keith and how to bow before him and learn the secret handshake. In between rank advancing to a different colored scarf, some would receive stripes on their scarves as a way to symbolize that they had advanced just not to the next rank. Each stripe cost more money, of course. Yellow. A yellow sash signified you becoming a coach. These coaches worked for free. It's been said that pretty women would get to the yellow sash rank fairly quickly after going to Keats Library, so we can only speculate what went on behind closed doors. There have been approximately 1,000 to 1,500 members who had received a yellow sash over the span of 20 years. In order to get to a yellow sash, you would have to spend at least $25,000 plus annual fees and each additional stripe which there were four, cost another $50,000. Orange. If you received an orange sash, you were a proctor. At this rank, you received either a very low salary or commission for recruiting members, but you still had to put that money back into Nexium. Clearly, this is textbook multi-level marketing. I'm not saying that every multi-level marketing company is going to turn into or is a sex cult, so please don't take that out of context. However, if we look at some people who don't have the same money as, let's say, Sarah and Claire Brofman because they're heiresses to a lot of money, or Alison Mack, who was an actress who had that kind of money. If, if we wanna look at just everyday average people, 
putting that kind of money back into Nexium is just a lot. It is a lot. So we need to keep that in mind that it wasn't just famous people that were in this cult that were giving so much money. There were average everyday people within this cult as well. One article stated that they estimated that there have been several hundred orange sashed proctors. In order to receive one of these, you would have to spend at least $250,000 and each additional stripe cost about $100,000 or more. Claire Brofman received an orange sash with four stripes on it that cost her more than $100 million. I found one article that said Allison Mack was an orange sash with one stripe. What is so incredibly sad is the average income for being an orange sash was $35,000 annually. So again, if you weren't some famous rich person, you're putting a lot of money that you do not have back into Nexium. Green. The next rank or sash color was a green sash. These were senior proctors. At this rank, you as a member would have invested around $1 million. There have been less than 20 green sashes. The average salary would be $90,000 and a possible promise of what one article called an avatar baby. Some notable green sash members are of the following. Lauren Salzman, who was green with four stripes. Loretta Garza Davila, green with four stripes. Sarah Brofman, green with three stripes. Sarah Edmondson, Green. What's different about Sarah Edmondson is she has become very outspoken about Nexium. She attended her first session in 2005 and she even opened for one of the ESPs in Vancouver in 2009. In January 2017, she says she was recruited into DOS by Lauren Salzman and she became Lauren's slave. They made Sarah give them personal information as collateral and about two months later she was branded and decided to leave Nexium shortly after that. But let's get back to some more notable green members. Alejandro Betancourt Ledesma, green with three stripes. Esther Carlson, green with one stripe. Emiliano Salinas Ocelli, green with one stripe. Omar Boone, green. Jimena Garza, green, and she got this after she got six women branded. Emiliano's sister, Cecilia Salinas, green, and Don Morrison, green, blue. A blue sash meant you were a counselor within Nexium, and these would cost you about $5 million. You would make a salary at this rank, but again, it wasn't nearly enough to cover what you were putting back into Nexium. Your income at this rank would be $200,000, and one notable member was Edgar Boone. Purple. Once you hit the rank to receive a purple sash, this meant you were a senior counselor. This rank was incredibly hard to reach and only three people ever reached this purple sash, which were Keith's girlfriends. Two of these members are deceased and one left Nexium. Barbara Jeske and Pam Caffris are the deceased women and Tony Natalie is the one who left. We will go over Barbara and Pam in the next part of this series because I do think that they deserve a video all for them. So that is going to be in the next part. Gold. A gold sash was reserved for the prefect or otherwise known as co-founder Nancy Salzman. Even though the sashes and what happens to get there is disturbing and intense, and I really do think that those two words are an understatement, there's something else that happens to make a note of, and that is of them playing volleyball. Now you may not think of volleyball as being anything bad, but The Vow did focus on this according to some articles I read because of course I haven't watched The Vow yet, but I do plan on doing that once I have more time. But they would play volleyball really late at night. Keith never showed up at the gym to play before 10.30 or 11, and they would play volleyball sometimes until even 7 a.m. Playing volleyball wasn't mandatory, but if you wanted to rank advance, guess what? You were going to play. When they would play, if Keith sat around the bleachers, it was almost as if everyone flocked to him because they just had to be by the vanguard. Some might not think anything of it because it's just volleyball, how harmful could it possibly be? But if you think about it, let's say that you're going to these sessions or these classes during the day, and then you're encouraged to go play volleyball, which is a physical activity, so not only are you mentally tired, but now you're physically tired. Keith was only doing this to break people down. One article that I was reading talked about how in the docu-series they showed Allison Mack meeting Keith for the first time at volleyball night. It's shown that she is really calm and happy at first and then she just starts to tear up. Keith told her that she is responsible for all of her unhappiness. There is one interview that a lot of people have used when they discuss Nexium, and if you watch Allison speaking with Keith, it's almost like she's mesmerized by him and it's almost like 
she may think, and I'm not trying to put words in her mouth, but it, it, it just, it looks like this, that it's almost as if she thinks he's a higher being of sorts. And when you listen to what Keith is saying, he's really not saying all that much. He's just kind of running around in circles with what he's saying. Do you know what I'm going to say right now? No. You're insecure about that. Yeah. Is that scary for you? No. Why not? Because I trust that what you're going to say is going to be good. And, be and in the end, you're going to be okay. Be fine. Yeah. When we have insecurities, and this relates to vulnerability, uh -huh. where we think we may not be okay, then it becomes scary. See, it's not the insecurity that's the problem, it's the fear of the insecurity. Mm -hmm. It's hard for a person to be deeply authentic mm -hmm. if they're inauthentic with themselves. Mm -hmm. And people who are inauthentic with themselves, the nature of being inauthentic with yourself is that you're blind to it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'd be authentic with yourself and then you'd be sort of conning yourself on top of it. Right. But true self inauthenticity is blindness, it's an incompletion. Hmm. But with understanding this philosophically and opening these areas up, then what are the practices? What are the actual practical tools right. that allow you to, if you will, it's, a, it's almost custom design. You, know, you might call it designer emotional states, right. designer emotional capacity, designer uh, emotional transitions. Yeah. Not only how do you design them, but how do you practice them? There is an entire documentary called The Lost Women of Nexium that covers all of these women in further detail. And if you remember from part one, there was a woman that I spoke about by the name of Gina Hutchison. When she was 14 years old in 1984, she had been raped by Keith, who was 24 at the time. In the state of New York, this was and still is statutory rape. In August of 2002, Gina reconnected with Keith and decided to join Nexium. On October 11th of 2002, Gina was found deceased with a gunshot wound to the head and her death was ruled a suicide. This happened at a Buddhist monastery, a place where Keith would be banned from eventually due to his advances towards the women and girls that were at this monastery. There has been speculation that Keith could have been responsible for Gina's death, and there is an article where Heidi, Gina's sister, had something to say about this. So I won't be reading all of what Heidi wrote, but let's go over some of it. As most of our readers know, my sister, Gina Rose Hutchinson, was found dead of a gunshot wound to her head on October 11, 2002, on the grounds of the KTD Buddhist Monastery in Woodstock, New York. Other young virgins Gina's age, some of her dearest friends, had also been repeatedly raped by Rainier. I don't believe Gina knew of those until many years later, if ever, in some cases. In fact, another of Keith Rainier's underage rape victims who wishes to remain anonymous confessed to me in about 2009 that she never told Gina that she, too, was raped by Rainier. One of the reasons for the girl's secrecy may have been the social stigma at that time, especially within certain religious cultures attached to a female's loss of virginity. Another reason Gina's friends may have long kept quiet about being raped by Rainier in their early teen years was that Gina had an ongoing relationship with Keith for decades thereafter. Rainier talked Gina into dropping out of school for him to become her mentor and convinced her that eventually they would marry and start a family together. Keith had this belief system that he was instilling in these girls that, you know, society was moronic and society was the culprit that brainwashed people against their true natures, you know, and, um, and disempowered women and, you know, Sexual uh, mores were all about keeping women bound and, and, you know, chained to the patriarchal system. He had those kinds of beliefs with regard to everything, including um, the school system. He didn't want Gina to go to school. He wanted Gina to leave school and become his consort. And she did, actually. He convinced her that he would be her mentor. And he, she was bright enough, and she certainly was, that she could get her GED and, and not have to go through the system. The system was the enemy, society, you know, and, and that's where I feel he really took her life completely off course. 
Rainier also claimed that Gina was a reincarnated Bodhisattva who would achieve enlightenment by following his teachings that Rainier was preordained or meant to be her spiritual as well as secular guide and soulmate, a concept that is not so alien to many traditional patriarchal religions. In Mormonism, for example, the religion Gina and I were mostly reared in, every male member holds a holy priesthood while a female church member's only direct link to God is through her husband's power of the priesthood. Gina was always a spiritual seeker, fond of Eastern philosophies like Buddhism especially. In Rainier, for a time, she found a god who had recognized her as his consort and set her on her life's mission to achieve enlightenment. In late 1989, however, Gina discovered that Rainier had been unfaithful to her for many years prior, that he was fornicating with other girls he mentored, many of whom Gina herself had recruited to become his earliest acolytes or inner circle. Gina was of course devastated, but after recovering from her shock and heartbreak, she went to work for Rainier's company starting with Consumers Byline in its IT department. I well recall the day in 1990 that Gina arranged for me to meet the smart, plucky Kristen Keefe, a young woman from out of town who was moving into the place Rainier already shared with a female roommate and business partner, Karen Unterreiner, at the now notorious 3 Flintlock Lane in Clifton Park, New York, near Albany. That day, Keefe lectured me that Gina's heartache over Rainier's broken promises was unwarranted because, quote, Gina doesn't own Keith's dick, end quote. Now that was something I agreed with, contrary to Rainier's apparent fear that I intended to leave with his dick in hand after what he did to Gina, so long as it might help Gina get over the douchebag Rainier was and is, though I don't think she ever truly did, unfortunately. Gina remained besties with Kristen thereafter and continued socializing with and often working for Rainier while searching for a new soulmate to match his broken vow to her. She also went on to a failed Mormon mission and successful college completion. Beginning in the mid-90s, Rainier experimented on Gina and according to Kristen for one, attempted to mind condition Gina into committing suicide as a way of achieving enlightenment in her next life as a Buddhist goddess. Kristen's testament to that fact is, by the way, well substantiated by Gina's journal and other eyewitnesses who have come forward. Rainier used snuff and suicide films and pictures along with street theater or gaslighting techniques to brainwash Gina into suicide, although in the end, the actual cause of her death may have been murder. Gina kept journals recording her dreams, thoughts, and events periodically for several years. In one rather prophetic entry dated July 24, 1998, Gina writes, Dreams of Keith. Everyone is there writing recommendations or a report for some agency that is checking his background. Karen, Pam, Kristen, etc. and I have a sheet to fill out and Keith is extremely nervous about what I might say. Somehow this report is linked to his goals, money, power, achievement. I decide that I won't reveal the negative things about him, but I choose not to say anything at all. Leave it blank so not to perjure myself in the future if I have to state the facts. It occurs to me that knowing him has changed my life pretty profoundly. Ultimately, you know, it was her choice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nobody pulled the trigger but her. You know, but if, if there were emotional triggers, certainly there were. You know, I think some of those were set by some of the events. You can come to your own conclusions or do your own research into this, but I do find it odd that so many tragedies occurred around Keith Rainier, which brings me to the disappearance of a woman from Nexium as well. This woman was 35-year-old Kristen Snyder, an environmental consultant that paid $7,000 in November of 2002 to attend this 16-day course in Anchorage, Alaska. Kristen was described as an overachiever and she was hoping that taking these classes, which she started off by taking classes in human potential in addition to ESP classes, would improve her life. Kristen was also an academic, having a master's degree. By February of 2003, while at the 16-day intensive course in Anchorage, 35-year-old Kristen started to act differently. Heidi Clifford, Kristen's spouse, said that Kristen was very sleep-deprived, delusional, and suicidal. February 6, 2003 was the last time Heidi saw Kristen. Kristen left the hotel they were staying in very upset. Alaska State Police think that Kristen drove out to Resurrection Bay and could have possibly drowned. There was a note found in a notebook inside Heidi and Kristen's Toyota Tacoma. The note read, quote, I attended a course called Executive Success Programs, aka Nexium, based out of Anchorage, Alaska and Albany, New York. 
I was brainwashed and my emotional center of the brain was killed or turned off. I still have feeling in my external skin, but my internal organs are rotting. Please contact my parents if you find me or this note. I am sorry, life. I didn't know I was already dead. May we persist into the future. No need to search for my body." End quote. Unfortunately, Kristen's body was never found, but was presumed dead by suicide. Kristen had no prior history of psychiatric or emotional issues before joining Nexium. Although they found other notes that were written before she disappeared, and it seemed like she was going through a mental breakdown after getting involved with these programs. In my opinion, I don't doubt that whatsoever. The techniques that they use and just how sleep deprived many people could have been along with the multitude of other things including brainwashing they had gone through and the indoctrination, it's just not surprising that people would have breakdowns after becoming part of Nexium. I mean, it is a cult after all. Kim Snyder, who is Kristen's sister, suspects that there was foul play and doesn't believe that the suicide note was written by Kristen. Although even with their suspicions, the family didn't file any police report. Kim did say that about a month before all of this happened, she had noticed Kristen had changed. Kristen was normally very level-headed and stable, whereas after she started taking these ESP courses, she was screaming and crying and just a completely different person. According to Rick Ross, Keith Rainier told the members of the cult that Kristen's suicide was a hoax. He said that Kristen was still alive and she had moved to Mexico. Along with that, there was a point in time where Nancy Salzman had said that the suicide note was fabricated. The main argument was because Nexium was spelled the way that it actually sounds, kind of like the medication Nexium, not with the spelling that we know today. She said that the ESP programs weren't called Nexium while Kristen was part of the programs at the time of her disappearance. In addition, Nancy spoke about how there were two notes, an original one and one that came later, and the one that came later was the one that was published in the media. She suggested that Kristen may have been alive and just tried to fake her death. This was all under oath while she testified for the deposition of the Rick Ross case. There was an investigation that was launched into Kristen's disappearance by Nexium. When Nancy was asked why, her response was, quote, well, Kristen Snyder disappeared while she was taking one of our courses. At the time, both Esther Chapone and Ed Kinnam, who were teaching the course, were very concerned that she didn't come back. And then when they found out that she had disappeared, they communicated with the Alaskan police. They communicated several times to the best of my recollection. And the police never attributed or linked any part of her disappearance to Nexium taking the course or anything like that, end quote. When asked who they was in her statement, she replied with quote, her partner, Heidi Clifford, and I believe her family because they had a memorial service for her within three weeks. That seemed very odd to me because when I really looked at how long people evaluate or remain hopeful that loved ones will be found after their disappearance, whether it's in a situation of war or a situation of disappearance or even when the World Trade Center collapsed, people remained hopeful for weeks, months, and even years that they would still find their loved ones and I don't believe had memorial services. But to do it within three weeks, it seemed odd that they came to the conclusion that yes, without finding a body or any other evidence that yes, not only did she disappear, but she died and had a memorial service, end quote. Nancy was asked about this suicide note and she said that there were two, as I already stated earlier. An original note that was left, but was not the one that was publicized in the newspaper a year later. The one that Nancy stated was published in the newspaper was the one that had Nexium's name on it, and it was spelled incorrectly because it was spelled the way that it sounds, not with just the letters, and that the name Nexium wasn't released to the public at the time. According to Nancy, the original note that police showed Esther Chapone was allegedly different. In her testimony, she kept saying, quote, that seemed very odd to us, end quote. I'm not sure if she was nervous, but Nancy, that seems very odd to me that you keep saying that. Sorry, I had to. I did find a photo of an alleged ESP logbook from November of 2002, where it shows the name Nexium very clearly at the bottom, along with Friday Night Volleyball. And if you didn't watch part two of this series, that's where I kind of spoke about their volleyball nights that they have. So it is quite possible that Kristen knew the name Nexium with the actual spelling that was used in the note. 
Kristen's mother knows that the note that I presented to you earlier was in Kristen's car, but she's not sure if her daughter wrote it. With that said, there has been speculation surrounding Kristen's disappearance and the suicide note that was left. Judging by what people have said about Kristen, it was unlike her to act the way she did after taking ESP courses. During Keith's trial in 2019, someone testified that after Kristen disappeared, Keith paid $24,000 to obtain the password to her email account. What is Keith hiding? Barbara Jeske and Pamela Kafritz were both rumored to be Keith's live-in girlfriends, according to Oxygen, who both passed away of cancer. Barbara had passed away of brain cancer in 2014 and Pamela of renal cancer in 2016. Some have speculated that maybe both Barbara and Pamela were poisoned, which caused the cancer. At the time of their deaths, Keith had inherited Barbara's three to four million dollar estate and Pam's eight million dollar estate. Barbara's sister, Cindy, did explain that Barbara was taking some kind of pills that smelled really bad. Apparently by this point, Barbara was already very sick, but she would just chew them and drink water or just drink juice afterwards. She didn't know what was in them, but said there could have been some kind of poison in them and that once Barbara was semi-comatose, Cindy stopped her from taking them. In addition to that, Barbara was skin and bones. She weighed 65 pounds right before her death, according to Cindy. Cindy said, quote, I do believe Rainier poisoned my sister and those other women, and I think he should be held accountable. I think Barbara started figuring out what was really going on in the group, and once he realized she was figuring it all out, I think he just wanted to do away with her, along with the fact that she was aging and he wanted younger women to take their place. So he got rid of the older ones and replaced them with younger ones, end quote. Cindy was actually a nurse that tried to care for Barbara for the last six weeks of her life and Keith tried to control everything within the last few days. This included banning Barbara to take pain medication and arranging for her to change her will. Later on, Cindy would also explain what happened after Barbara had passed away and what Keith wanted to do with Barbara's body. Quote, when I first got down there, she was still with us and I asked her what she wanted to be done with her body and she said, I want a Christian burial and I want it at my mom and dad's. But then the group told me they were going to take her body and freeze it, that they had the rights to it. And at this point, she started going into a coma. I had to seek out help of an attorney who said it was illegal for them to take her body. They still wanted to take the body and I said, no way. And Keith said, okay, we'll take the head. It was extremely upsetting for me and also very suspicious. I even had to follow them all the way to the funeral home after her death to make sure they didn't take her body, end quote. I'm honestly at a loss for words. Can you imagine losing your sister, having a suspicion that someone did this to her, and then having to worry about her body possibly being either stolen or being taken apart? That's another level of disturbing. Then there was Pamela, or otherwise known as Pam Caffritz. Pam was a very high-ranking person within Nexium, and she was Keith Rainier's life partner. Pam was a daughter of Washington socialites Buffy and William Caffritz. Keith and Pam had met when they were younger while they were on a ski trip, and after that, Pam had become involved with him during the 90s when he started his company, Consumers Byline Incorporated. Pam co-founded a subgroup, if you will, of Nexium that was called Jeunesse. It was started in 2006, and some articles say that it was started by Keith, while others say Pam Caffritz was also involved in starting this group. But this organization claimed to be a women's movement or like a women empowerment type of a group that was supposed to explore what it means to be a woman. Jeunesse promoted the type of thinking that men and women are wired differently. For Jeunesse, I think is the most gratifying thing that I've ever done. Um, it's the most challenging thing I've ever done because it consists of working with a group of people in a way that is totally interdependent, meaning um, we're all working together and no one is ever punished and no one is ever um, told that they're wrong or they're bad. And the most important thing in working on Jeunesse is the relationships in Jeunesse. And I'm not used to that. I'm used to the objective being met. I'm used to having like strict, hard, fast, deadlines and lots of fear and punishment if I don't get it right. And in working for Jeunesse, there isn't any of that. So it, it comes purely from a place of self-motivation and um, self-direction. And that is really difficult. But I would say that working for the Jeunesse is the most satisfying and purposeful thing I've ever done. 
According to some testimonies, Jeunesse members were allegedly taught women are irresponsible, if not narcissistic, self-absorbed, and inclined to cast themselves as the victim. In other words, this group was disguising itself as women empowerment when it really wasn't. This is just a brief overview of Jeunesse. We are going to dive into this in the next part of this series. If you remember from part one, I spoke about a woman who had been kept in confinement. They referred to her as Danny or Daniela. Well, she was a DOS slave. She had allegedly become pregnant by Keith and Pam was allegedly there to guide Danny through the process of getting an abortion for this alleged pregnancy. Danny has said that she believes Pam was there to make sure Keith wasn't liable for certain things. What's incredibly sad is an incident that I had read about that happened to a 12 year old girl that Pam was allegedly involved with. She hired this girl to walk her dog and she would have the girl visit the home that Keith and Pam had together. Her mother actually worked for Keith's company, Consumers Byline. Keith allegedly raped her on more than one occasion, and then two years after this, in 1993, the now 14-year-old at the time filed a police report. In the end, Keith had her sign a waiver saying that what she had told officers was not true and she wouldn't press charges. I would really like to know what Keith could have possibly, allegedly, threatened her with that she signed a waiver. After Pam had passed away, Keith, along with a few others, used her identity and credit card to charge over $300,000. However, as I mentioned earlier, Keith inherited a lot of money after Pam's death. So why did he use her credit card? In the closing statement that Assistant U.S. Attorney Moira Penza presented, she did say, quote, why did he use Pam Caffritz's credit card after she was dead to fund his lifestyle? to avoid paying taxes, end quote. I don't find that statement to be too far-fetched and I do agree that that's probably why he did it. In one article, they said that they had four cats living in that house as well and they too became ill and were diagnosed with cancer. These were the only people and animals that lived in this house because of course Keith didn't live there, so it is a bit suspicious. I mean, there's no concrete evidence, nor did Keith admit to poisoning these women, but in my opinion, I am speculating that this wasn't a coincidence. There was a former Nexium member named Kristen Keithy who dated Keith and was diagnosed with cervical cancer. The only difference is Kristen survived. Kristen was incredibly high ranking and she had been by Keith's side from 2007 to 2014. She dealt with more of the legal side of Nexium. Kristen was the one who worked with the lawyers to fight lawsuits and to go after people who were spreading information that would possibly expose Nexium for what it really was. Keith and Kristen did have a son together. And while their son was their biological son, Keith had made Kristen say that they adopted him so that Keith could uphold his reputation about being celibate. It was reported that Keith tried to keep his son away from people and that he was to be cared for by five different nannies. Each one had to speak a different language. Towards the end of Kristen's time at Nexium, she found out about some more shady things that were happening when it came to the finances. In 2014, Kristen was really worried about her son's well-being, so she left Nexium. When she first escaped, she stayed at the home of Frank Parlato in the Florida Keys for about a year. I can't even imagine how scary that must have been to be so terrified that you go into hiding. I'm not excusing any of the bad things that she could have possibly done within her time at Nexium, but at the same time, I do recognize that she was indoctrinated into this cult. People will do anything when they're in a cult, especially for their leader. Kristen and her son have been in hiding since. According to one article, they spoke about how Kristen had alleged in 2015 that Keith had asked a Canadian investigative firm called Canaprobe to obtain financial information on six federal judges, a U.S. senator, a reporter, editor, and publisher of the Times Union. All of this is absolutely horrible and disturbing. This is why I'm such a cynic and I analyze everything. I won't sit here and say that I'd never join a cult because as some people call MLM companies commercial cults, I joined not one, but two MLM companies in my life. Anything is possible, but I've learned more about cults within this past year than ever before, and it can really happen to anyone. If we look at something like Scientology, there's so much information out there about Scientology, 
but people still join Scientology every day. According to Oxygen, there was an unidentified woman who lived with Keith as well, who survived bladder cancer. This woman had given a hair sample to a forensics expert and they allegedly found traces of poison that is found in gunpowder and rat poison. Frank Parlato stated, quote, I don't think the official stories on the deaths of these four women should be allowed to rest without a challenge, end quote. Frank, I agree with you a hundred percent. Now that I've spoken about some children and Keith wanting to uphold his reputation of being celibate, even though he wasn't, let's talk about some other children that Keith had or almost had. Of course, we already spoke about Kristen and Keith's son, along with speaking about how Daniela had this alleged abortion. Well, when Daniela testified, she spoke about how not only did she allegedly terminate her pregnancy, but so did two of her sisters. Daniela had this alleged pregnancy in 2003, while her sister Camila was allegedly pregnant and terminated her pregnancy in 2008. Another one of Daniela's sisters, Mariana, allegedly terminated two pregnancies with Keith before she got pregnant a third time with her son. I cannot imagine what these women went through emotionally and mentally, especially if they wanted to have children or if they dreamt of being a mother. If all of this is true, and that's why I said allegedly a bunch of times because I only saw a few sources that were talking about this, not all of them talked about this. So if this is true, what kind of monster forces women to terminate their pregnancies all because he wanted to have his cake and eat it too, allegedly. He wanted to appear celibate, but would have sex with countless women and then tell them that they couldn't be with any other man besides him. If you're not familiar with what DOS stands for, it's a Latin phrase that translates to master over slave women. Before we proceed, I wanted to share a quote I found during my research for this part of the series. I think it's important to present this in a video because I'm sure a lot of cult victims have beat themselves up over joining a cult and wondering that there is something wrong with them for doing it. A Los Angeles therapist by the name of Rachel Bernstein said, quote, I've talked to about a thousand former cult members who will say, I feel like because I said yes to the first thing, I didn't have a right to complain about what happened to me afterward, end quote. It's sad that after being a victim to a cult, these members can possibly even think this way. That's why I'm so glad that there is help out there on how to deprogram from a cult. So without further ado, let's just move on to the video. Nexium has been associated with multiple different organizations. Jeunesse was for women, while the Society of Protectors was aimed predominantly at men. There was also the Rainbow Cultural Garden that was started in 2006, which is where children were exposed to reading seven different languages. Some Nexium members within the inner circle were reportedly taught that in their past lives, they were high ranking Nazis. Barbara Boucher was allegedly told she was a reincarnation of a Holocaust architect. Reinhard Heydrich and Nancy Salzman were allegedly reincarnations of Hitler, while Keith Rainier was a leader of anti-Nazi partisans. I know I've repeated myself numerous times, but I really wonder if Keith believed this to be true or if he was just outright lying to people. I would love to one day find out which one it is or if it's a little bit of both, but with all that being said, let's just get into the Society of Protectors. The Society of Protectors, or otherwise referred to as SOP, was founded in 2011. This group was supposed to build character and turn members, as per Mark Vicente, from little boys into men. Mark Vicente was born in South Africa on June 22, 1965. Mark was one of the prosecution's key witnesses in the Nexium trial. He's also married to Bonnie PC, who is an Australia-born musician and actress. The two met while they were both part of Nexium. Both Mark and his wife Bonnie were high-ranking within Nexium, and both of them became alarmed once they stayed in Nexium a little bit longer. Bonnie was worried about how obsessed the women had become regarding her weight. She was eventually able to convince Mark that they needed to get out of Nexium, that something more sinister was happening. They both left in 2017. There was an interview that Mark did where the interviewer said, I think it does a good job of explaining how a regular smart person might fall into something like this when speaking on the topic of the vow. Mark responded with quote, 
Exactly, and I think that's been done very well because one of the things that both Jahane and Kareem, who were the VOW directors, spoke about at great length was this idea that in order to have people understand how this works, they have to understand the dream. What was the thing that people fell in love with and felt attached to that had them stick around as long as they did? End quote. Mark said that for him, Nexium was a way for him to understand human behavior a little bit better. He does believe that for some people, they were yearning for community and purpose, and they found that with Nexium. I'll leave the interview that Mark did below if you'd like to read the entire thing, but back to SOP. As with most things within Nexium, to be part of SOP, you needed to pay to become part of this society. If you allegedly did what you were told in this group, you'd get your money back. SOP members would have these readiness drills, which were practiced just in case there was some kind of emergency. This group was supposed to teach men how to act with women. Somehow the society made so much money that it was hard for them to keep track of it to report the earnings to the IRS. I wonder if that was an intentional error, allegedly. SOP would teach about how men are naturally polygamous and women are naturally monogamous. Women were told that they should accept that men are to have multiple sexual partners because it's natural and biologically right while the woman could only be with one man. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm just internally screaming at this, but it only gets worse. SOP claims that women are spoiled and pampered and that men get the brunt of everything. Along with that, women and men were kind of in a way compared to dogs. The Vanguard, or otherwise known as Keith, said that if a man ejaculates on a woman, he's marking his territory like a freaking dog. I don't think my eyes can roll any further back into my freaking head at this point. The Rainbow Cultural Garden is what we're going to go over next. This was founded by Keith in 2006. This organization was supposed to be a revolutionary child development program promoting children's cultural, linguistic, emotional, physical, and problem solving potential. Children as young as two were exposed to be taught how to speak seven different languages at a young age. From my understanding, it seems like a child would be with a caretaker who spoke, let's say, Spanish, and then they would quickly switch to a new caretaker who spoke, I don't know, let's say German. Rainbow Cultural Garden had 11 locations all around the world. There have been mixed opinions regarding this organization. Some think that this was just a way to squeeze out even more money from Nexium members who just so happen to be parents. Some child development specialists didn't think this organization was too damaging, but just difficult to achieve as a child, while others thought this would harm children and in turn, these children wouldn't be fluent in any language. This program was a daycare of sorts. It was never licensed as one. They had to shut one of the locations in Miami down in 2018 because of this very reason. However, cult expert Rick Ross spoke on this organization, quote, it wasn't about language. It was about indoctrinating children to be like him. He was the prototype and he was always interested in cloning himself and perpetuating his ideas. So to think that it was only ever simply about being multilingual is incredibly naive. It was never just about that. It was about him, his philosophy and perpetuating his world view, end quote. There was a similar program that was opened up in France in 2018. It's through a company called Athal Education Group where Sarah Brofman and her husband founded and financed. In December of 2018, Athal launched their program called Campus Beyond the School, which claimed that it would have children as young as two mastering their mind, body, expression, and world, while also learning the same exact seven languages that Rainbow taught, and those were German, English, Arabic, Chinese, Spanish, French, Japanese, and Russian. According to a former Nexium member, Ariella Menashi, who tried to open her own Rainbow School, said that Athal's program sounds 100% like Rainbow, even the languages were the same. Rick Ross would try and deter people from attending any schools or camps that are affiliated with Keith. He also said, quote, child protection officials should be looking very closely at those schools, end quote. Frank Parlato thinks that we should focus on the abuse that's happening there, quote, these children are being raised by a series of strangers who are not high paid, who are speaking to them in different languages every day. And the kids don't get a rest. They don't get the opportunity to just talk with their mother or be with their father, end quote. In 2010, Keith did say that he believed children would have a better time if they were brought up with three or five different cultures so that they can see themselves as something that is beyond those cultures. 
in December of 2017, an investigation was started into the UK Rainbow Cultural Program. Ofsted was the agency that started the investigation and they said that the allegations were extremely concerning. However, eventually, Ofsted closed the investigation, stating that the program doesn't need to register with the agency due to the parents remaining in the home with their children while they are being taught. I'm not 100% sure if they are still operating today, but I'd be worried if it was, especially with how much media coverage has surrounded Nexium. There was a school called Sunshine's Multicultural Academy in Guatemala City, and it seems as though it may have some kind of ties back to Rainbow. The reason being is because at one point, they use the Rainbow logo and they promote that young children have the opportunity to learn up to five languages. In September of 2018 is when the school removed all rainbow logos and they changed their name to Sunshine's Guatemala. At the time of filming this in February of 2021, they posted just a few days ago. It seems as though they are still teaching multiple different languages. Now that we've gone over the subgroups that have to do with the men and children, let's move on to the women. Unlike Das, Janess didn't really have too much of a meaning behind the name besides one member who described it as, quote, a made up word that we are defining as we define who we are, end quote. It was started in 2006 and some articles say it was started by Keith, while others say Pam Caffritz was also involved in starting this group. This organization claimed to be a women's movement that was supposed to explore what it means to be a woman. Allison Mack did have a comment about Janess back in 2013. She said, quote, working for Janess is the most gratifying thing I've ever done. It's the most challenging because it consists of working with a group of people who are interdependent. No one is ever punished or told what they're wrong or they're bad, end quote. I've noticed that interdependence has been brought up more than once with Nexium. If you remember from the part of this series about the sash color ranking system and the 12 point mission statement, within the mission statement, they spoke about interdependence quite a bit. The parts of the 12 mission statement that I'm referring to is number three and number nine. Interdependence has also been referenced in other articles I was reading, but in case you missed part two of this series, number three in the mission statement says, I'm committed to my success. I understand that we must all elevate ourselves and thus elevate all others, just as everyone else elevates us. This is interdependence. Number nine says, real success is never at the expense of others. As a successful individual, I will never envy someone else's success. I will rejoice because I understand that the success of others elevates me even a little, because I'm also part of the human team. The updating of human potential by anyone is a tribute to the whole humanity team. If others are successful, I will protect their success against those who envy them. I promise to free myself from all habits that are based in parasitism and envy and replace them with habits of effort and interdependence. And that's what was written in the 12 point mission statement. So working for Janess is grounding and satisfying and humbling and Wonderful. Wonderful. Jeunesse promoted the type of thinking that men and women are wired differently. According to some testimonies, Jeunesse members were allegedly taught women are irresponsible, if not narcissistic, self-absorbed, and inclined to cast themselves as the victim. Um, what? Excuse me while I go puke in my mouth a little bit with this kind of sexist thinking. A Rolling Stone article that wrote about SOP talks about how men didn't experience the same depth of experience while women are less adept at understanding right and wrong. Then there was something that Lauren Salzman said, quote, women feel oppressed and the men would try to stick up for themselves and we would all attack them. We cut them off constantly just because we're excited and impulsive, but we didn't understand that they felt unheard or disrespected or uncared for." End quote. Oy. The workshops for Jeunesse were 11 eight-day workshops and cost Jeunesse members about $5,000 each. The Jeunesse website is no longer up, but when it was, it said that Jeunesse is a women's movement that facilitates an ongoing exploration of what it means to be a woman through open dialogue and development of friendships. Jeunesse engages women from all over the world and allows them to discover the true essence of womanhood. The members of Jeunesse were encouraged to use hashtags such as what makes a woman and Janessing. Surprisingly enough, the Janess Instagram account is still up, although their last post was from 2017. I'm a little shocked though that it's still up given how much coverage this has gotten and the nature of what Janess actually stood for. 
Glamour published an article that was dedicated to speaking about Doss and Jeunesse. In that article, they are talking about a testimony for a woman who was part of Jeunesse. This woman that they identify as Sylvie spoke about how Jeunesse was unorganized and haphazard. When Sylvie told Keith what she thought of the program, he allegedly berated her, told her she was cold hearted and that her children wouldn't love her. Even with all of this, Sylvie went back to the group. Jeunesse was supposed to empower women and help for you to grow and overcome obstacles. After Sylvie attended these courses, she heard about DOS. Sylvie, along with other members, were torn down and built back up as a cult does. Janji Lalik, a California-based cult specialist and sociologist, reportedly said, quote, We have all kinds of people that we use for sounding boards, and we get reality checks. All of a sudden, you're in Albany, and you've got all these pressures working on you all the time, and you've got nobody to whom you can say, do you think this is weird, end quote. Janja also spoke about how cults nowadays are looking for career-driven people, participants who are productive, because this means that they will work hard in building this company or cult, along with broadening the reach with their social networks and people who have money. This makes a lot of sense because these people can be actual slaves, but be productive ones, or ones that can build the cult disguise as a business. Something to also keep in mind if you've ever been targeted for something such as a cult or if you were targeted at a vulnerable spot in your life, Janja also says, quote, we all have vulnerability points and that's not a mental illness. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with you, but all of us throughout life have experiences or moments where we're vulnerable, which means we're open and we're a little raw. So if at the moment someone comes along and says, here, let me help you, you're open to that. You'll take that risk, end quote. If we bring this back to the anti-MLM content I usually make on this channel, that's what these MLM companies do. That's why you always hear reps telling you their sob story or their rags to riches story. It's because you can relate to them if where they were before the MLM is the same situation as your current one. When you're yearning for something so bad, if someone comes along and dangles this dream in front of you or this is the thing that you're looking for, your critical thinking may just go out the window. That is why I present my anti-MLM content the way that I do. Anyway, back to Jeunesse. There was one woman by the name of Nicole who borrowed money from her parents to attend these courses. She was an actress who didn't want to be just an actress. She wanted to be a great actress. There was a time where she started feeling suicidal and she decided to call Allison Mack. This was the perfect opportunity for Allison to pitch DOS. Allison disguised DOS as a women empowerment group that you would have to pay money for. What was strange for this group is you had to provide collateral. This included nude photos or videos, embarrassing information, money, etc. Sounds a little bit like blackmail if you ask me. The women were told that this was so that the secret of DOS wouldn't be spoken about because it was, at the end of the day, a secret society. Nicole was a little nervous about having to provide collateral because that would mean that this was a long-term commitment, maybe even a lifelong commitment, but she wanted to be mentored by Allison. I mean, I really can't blame her because here you have this celebrity, this actress, that maybe even Nicole aspired to be, and she's willing to mentor you. Along with that, let's not forget about Nicole's mental state at the time. She was vulnerable. Nicole was told that her third assignment within DOS was to reach out to Keith. Then once she finally got a response, Allison allegedly told Nicole to meet Keith and do anything he asked her to. According to Nicole, eventually she was blindfolded and brought to an unknown location. She was told to get on the table where her wrists and feet were tied. There was another person in the room, and I won't get into too much detail, but this other person started performing sexual acts on Nicole. She didn't know that this was going to happen to her, and allegedly, while Keith was in the room as well, he said that nothing bad would happen to her and that she's a young woman who's allowed to be sexual. I really cannot imagine what was going through her mind when this was happening or what was said to her throughout all of her time with Nexium. Now that you know a little bit about Nicole's story and how courageous she was to tell her story during the trial, I want to talk a little bit more about DOS. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, DOS stands for a Latin phrase that translates to master over slave women. This was a high control group where women had a slave master type relationship. The reason why the HBO series The Vow was called that is because they called DOS The Vow. 
just as the other two groups that I spoke about, the SOP and Jeunesse, DOS also required you to give them collateral and money to join. They were put on what some have called the Nexium diet, which was anywhere from 500 to 800 calories a day. I've seen a few different numbers when it comes to the calories consumed. However, 500 is the most popular. I did speak to Kat Benson from Unlock Nutrition here on YouTube, and she said that 1200 calories is lowest recommended unless with doctor oversight for very specific reasons. And even then 1200 is way lower than what CAT has people do because it can slow metabolism and increases risk of nutrient deficiencies. The New York Times reported that Keith called DOS a sorority and Allison Mack said it was supposed to be a way for these women to aspire to be better and quote, DOS was about women coming together and pledging to one another a full-time commitment to become our powerful and embodied selves by pushing on our greatest fears, by exposing our greatest vulnerabilities, by knowing that we would stand with each other no matter what, by holding our word, by overcoming pain, end quote. However, DOS was a little more sinister than these people were letting on. The women of DOS were sex slaves and there were plenty of times where they posed, allegedly, together naked for what they called their family photos. What these women didn't know at first was that these family photos were being secretly sent to Keith. DOS had more than 50 slaves in eight different groups and one group for each first line master. While these women thought that other women were their masters, they weren't aware that Keith was the ultimate master. Two DOS slaves did share their stories at the trial and they said that they would not have joined DOS if they knew a man was in charge all along. The whole idea of the ESP classes, which also translated into a lot of these subgroups such as DOS, was what one article called a lot like the new age psychological idea of radical responsibility where an individual takes charge of everything in their life, even if they aren't at fault. In other words, they were trying to teach you that everything is your responsibility, even if you really had no control over what happened. Essentially, this made it easier for the members or slaves to be gaslit. If you don't know what that term means, it's a form of psychological manipulation in which a person or group covertly sows seeds of doubt in a targeted individual or group, making them question their own memory, perception, or judgment. I was reading about how The Vow did present a phone call between Sarah Edmondson and her master, Lauren Salzman. During this phone call, Lauren said that because Sarah joined us, it was her choice to be branded even though Sarah was not made aware of the branding until not too long before it happened. When you think of branding, you think of animals, right? This is still something that happens to this day when it comes to branding animals. However, this was happening to women within DOS. Originally, the idea was to get a little tattoo that came from Allison Mack, that was her idea, and somehow it turned into branding instead. Sarah Edmondson spoke about the night she was branded. She was taken to a hotel and had been blindfolded and told to take all of her clothes off. After her blindfold was taken off, she saw that she was in a room with other naked women from Nexium. They were driven to a secret location and that's when they started branding each woman with a branding pen. The brand was supposed to represent the four elements. However, after Sarah looked at the brand a little closer, she saw that it looked like Allison's initials and then if you turned it to the side, it looked like Keith's initials. Sarah later said that the branding was worse in childbirth. The woman who allegedly branded 13 women was a doctor by the name of Danielle Roberts. I've seen some use Mad Doctor as her nickname and I think it's very fitting given what she allegedly did. Danielle is an osteopathic physician. I actually had to look up what an osteopathic physician was because I was curious to know what it meant and it's a branch of the medical profession in the United States. These types of physicians are licensed to practice medicine and surgery in all 50 states and are recognized to varying degrees in 85 other countries. In 2018, even after people were made aware of what Danielle had allegedly done, she did try to recruit people into joining her wellness group. According to witness accounts and federal court documents, these women who were being branded were held down by other members and this process could take up to an hour. These women were supposed to send photos of the brand every day for a month and then once a week for the following month. These photos were then supposed to be sent to Danielle. I'm going to be hopeful 
that this was to check up on it and make sure that there was no infection. The Daily Mail had written an article in 2018 that said at that point in time, even after multiple reports, Danielle was cleared of any wrongdoing by the New York State Board of Health. In that same article that reported on this wellness group, it said that they had learned there was a Nexium member who was supposed to speak at a medical conference about holistic healing. And this is where Danielle was promoting her membership about her wellness group. Her group was called EXO or ESO, which is a program that's designed to build total mastery over the physical, emotional, and thought components of human performance. As with a lot of things nowadays, it was really expensive, costing $750 for one class. The conference members were offered a 10% discount if they signed up within 72 hours. I'm not surprised that Danielle used FOMO as a way to get people to sign up. This isn't anything new and it's a very, very common marketing tactic in any industry. There was a group rate offered if people signed up in force. On March 5th of 2020, the State Department of Health's Board of Professional Medical Conduct did charge Danielle, the 39 year old, of practicing medicine with gross incompetence and gross negligence, morally unfit conduct, practicing fraudulently or beyond the scope, performing services not authorized by the patient and failing to maintain records. The board was also alleged that on March 9, 2017, Danielle betrayed her medical license when she branded the 13 women within DOS. Then she failed to report a flu-like communicable disease outbreak where attendees at a 2016 YMCA event were severely infected. This YMCA event included 438 people, 76 of those were children. It just so happened that this is where Nexium held an annual week-long celebration of Keith's birthday. An article that was published on coleducation.com on December 24, 2020, stated that Danielle faces the possibility of losing her medical license or at the very least having it suspended and having to pay a fine. Danielle had the audacity to say, quote, for me to have a conversation with family members and experience that no matter what I say, because that seed has planted that we've been brainwashed, everything I've said has been invalidated. I think it really damages the way that women are viewed. I think it damages ownership in general for people. You know, I think it gives people an out essentially to not take responsibility for their choices and their decisions. And it is ultimately extremely, extremely destructive. And especially for the women's empowerment movement, end quote. Danielle, you allegedly branded women. You allegedly used a cauterizing iron for about an hour to brand the initials of Keith Rainier and Allison Mack on 13 women. How do you expect people to react and view you? Even if let's say this wasn't called a sex cult, the branding alone as a doctor who used no anesthetic and saw women being held down by people along with screaming is disgusting. How could you do that? That's a serious question if she ever comes across this video. Now I understand that she may still be allegedly indoctrinated into this cult, but if she's not and she actually believes what she's saying, she's a vile human being. There was another medical professional whose medical license was revoked in 2019. This was a Brandon Porter. Brandon Porter, a medical doctor, was the one who allegedly basically used 200 people in an experiment. This is what some have referred to as a fright study. During this fright study, Brandon was recording EEG responses as his victims watched footage of people being murdered, decapitated, and other disturbing videos. Then in 2016, that same event that Danielle was at where she failed to report a flu-like outbreak, Brandon was there too. Because Brandon also failed to report this outbreak, he was in violation of his duties as a licensed medical doctor. Just a few years later, his license was revoked. I'm sure for victims of both Danielle and Brandon, many of them were hesitant to trust doctors once they were out of this cult. Sarah was born on June 22nd of 1977. She is a Canadian actress and studied theater at Lord Bang Secondary School in Vancouver. 
Sarah went on to graduate from Concordia University in Montreal with a bachelor's in theater performance. Sarah and her husband, Anthony Ames, have two beautiful children that Sarah very frequently posts about on Instagram. Her youngest was born in March of 2019. Some of her work includes Are You Afraid of the Dark? And if you're a 90s kid like myself, you probably remember hearing about that. Student Bodies, Big Wolf on Campus, Andromeda, and more. Sarah was nominated in 2007 for the Leo Awards as Best Lead Performance by a Female in a Short Drama for her role in Sparklight Motel. I'm not sure if I'm saying that properly. She's also done original voices for various Barbie, Bratz, and Polly Pocket movies, along with the voice of Lori in Transformers. Cybertron, Atlanta in Class of the Titans, and Sydney Garner in Max Steel. Sarah also starred in some Lifetime and Hallmark movies. While she was in Nexium, her acting career kind of suffered a little bit, and it wasn't until after she got out of Nexium that she started to receive some better gigs. There was one television movie called The Sisterhood that Sarah starred in as a reporter. And the story within this movie is something that Sarah is probably familiar with, even though she wasn't a reporter, but it's about a cult-like group of women who force their members to perform dangerous activities in exchange for getting what they wanted out of life. Due to Sarah's involvement and very public denouncement of Nexium, she became the subject of a podcast called Uncover Escaping Nexium in 2018. Sarah wrote a book called Scarred, The True Story of How I Escaped Nexium, The Cult That Bound My Life, and it was published in September of 2019. In regards to her book and sharing her personal experience of being part of this cult for 12 years, in the book's forward, she said, quote, As I work to regain my personal power and move past what happened, there's a special message I have for the friends and people close to me whom I became distant from or lost contact with over the years I was a proponent of Nexium's practices. I'm deeply sorry. Hopefully my actions and all that I share in this book will be a step towards making amends as I begin to repair the impact my 12 year journey had on those around me." End quote. Jessica Bruder, who was a critic, thought the book was riveting yet disturbing and that it was more of a cautionary tale rather than an apology. Sarah has since launched a podcast called A Little Bit Culty with her husband as a co-host. During one interview about her time in Nexium, Sarah said, quote, I really thought these seminars were a wonderful opportunity. I have a lot of guilt about the people I brought in, but if there's one thing I can hang my hat on, it's that I never lied. I thought Keith Rainier was the greatest, wisest, most brilliant man on earth. I had no idea what was going on with the women and everything that came out in the FBI's investigation." End quote. When Sarah Edmondson was recruited into DOS, she had to check in with Lauren Salesman three to four times a day because Lauren was her master. These women had to ask their masters if they could sleep and eat or if the master needed anything. Other slaves would do housework and errands for Lauren while they pushed Sarah to recruit more people. Remember how I spoke about how these women were told to give collateral in order to become part of DOS? Well, Sarah Edmondson says that you had to give new collateral every month and then every week. Sarah had to record herself lying about her husband. She had to say in this recording that her husband abused her and her son, even though that was not the truth. These masters were making their slaves fabricate this collateral because they so badly wanted to make sure that people wouldn't talk. I'm so glad that so many people started to speak out against Nexium so that this could be brought to light. I highly doubt that anyone would listen or believe this to be the truth if it weren't for all the victims who spoke out. I do want to take a moment to recognize all of the victims from Nexium and thank those who spoke out and were a voice for not only themselves, but for the countless others who were maybe too afraid to speak out. They also helped prevent the sex cult to continue the way that it was. They probably saved plenty of potential victims that would have been preyed upon. Which brings me to another woman's story that I wanted to share, and that's the story of India Oxenberg. I find India's background so interesting, so before we get into her time at Nexium, I want to go over her as a person and her family. India was born on June 7th of 1991 to Catherine Oxenberg and William Weitz Schaefer. She's also the granddaughter of the Yugoslavian princess, Princess Elizabeth, and Howard Oxenberg, who was in the clothing industry. Howard was the first one to mass market maternity clothes. 
Because of her grandparents, India was a descendant of Peter I of Serbia and a relative of the family ruled over the Kingdom of Serbia and Yugoslavia. The Oxenbergs are relatives of the British, Danish, and Greek royal family. India grew up in Malibu, California and would become an American film producer, writer, actress, and TV personality. In 1992, William, her father, was actually arrested for smuggling marijuana from Thailand and it was reported that he profited $50 million from drug trading. India was in Nexium from 2011 to 2018, so she was in it for seven years and for two of those years she was a member of DOS. Last year, in 2020, she published her book, Still Learning a Memoir. She was recruited by none other than Alison Mack. India had confided in Allison when she felt like she wasn't really progressing the way that she would have hoped within Nexium. That's when Allison told her that she had a secret that could help India, but that India would have to provide collateral so that she would keep this a secret. The collateral she gave Allison is what I spoke about just a few minutes ago about India's dad getting arrested for smuggling marijuana. You would think that that would be enough collateral, but India gave details of overseas bank accounts to Allison as well. India said that the DOS masters put all of the slaves on strict schedules. She lived with Allison in Albany, New York, and she had to always ask Allison for permission to do literally anything. Her day started off by taking a cold shower, then weighing herself. Allison allegedly only allowed India to eat between 500 to 800 calories in a day so that she could lose weight. In one article, it spoke about how India realized after she left Nexium, this was so that she could appear more childlike in Keith's eyes. India was told to send Allison a journal with all of what she ate in a day and the calories associated with the foods that she ate. In addition, she had to ask for permission to eat and had to stop eating by 5 p.m. During the rest of the day, she had to clean Allison's home and she went to the Nexium headquarters and either taught or took courses, then had to read articles written by Keith. To make matters even stricter, India had to have her phone on her at all times. She had to respond to Allison within seconds. In India's book, she said, quote, if I deviated from any of these rules, then Allison gave me a penance which would be any kind of display of pain to show my loyalty and willingness to correct a transgression, end quote. That penance could be anything from reading more of Keith's work or standing in the snow at three o'clock in the morning. This is where the indoctrination would really rear its ugly head. These women who were going through what India was going through were being broken down. They were slaves to other women, and if they did something off course, it meant they would be punished for it. Can you imagine having to walk on eggshells like that? I mean, not only is your every move completely controlled, but you're broken to the point where these people can mold you into whoever they want you to be. If you look at a lot of the main players that I spoke about so far in this series, these are wealthy and intelligent people. As I said in the previous part of this series, cults want those types of people in their organization. They want people who are able to market this cult. They want people who will run the business side, essentially. These women were taught that if you were afraid of having a sexual encounter with Keith, that that meant you needed to do more self-improvement. The way that you could become more fulfilled is if you seduced Keith and read his work and any sexual encounter with him was a way for you to work through your intimacy issues, allegedly. The indoctrination was so strong with India that when the FBI first questioned her in 2018, she denied anything bad or sexual happening within Nexium. She didn't believe she was lying because she truly believed the statement that what was happening within Nexium was normal. She believed it so much so that when Allison Mack had been arrested, India, as her slave, packed up all of Allison's belongings and put it into storage. However, she ended up taking these items and holding them at her own home. These included things such as jewelry, a diary, and a box of flash drives. Six months after India had packed up Allison's things, she remembered that there were these flash drives, so she decided to see what was on them because she was just really curious. 
There were audio recordings on these flash drives, one of which Keith was describing the branding and how he wanted his initials burned into the pelvic skin of the attractive women he hand picked. Another recording was of Keith telling the DOS masters to make it look like the women at these induction ceremonies really truly wanted this. What's so sad is during these branding ceremonies, they were all naked and didn't have any anesthesia. The pain was so bad for some that they had to be held down. After hearing these audio recordings and speaking with her mother, Catherine, India Oxenberg was ready to go to the FBI and tell them all that she knew and what happened. During her time in Nexium, India's relationship with her mother was a little strained. Since Nexium, her and her mother have healed their relationship, and after about two years of intensive therapy and deprogramming, she could see that her mother was not only trying to protect her when she saw what had happened to her during her time with Nexium. Her mother really tried to protect her daughter a lot after all of this became public, especially because the media made her out to be just a cult girl or just a sex slave, when India was so much more than that. She was still a human being. Part of the healing journey for India is reclaiming her life and the narrative. India has taken up boxing along with being able to work through the near starvation diet within Nexium. She's been able to love food again. Instead of going to a plastic surgeon to remove the brand, she decided to design a tattoo. India said, quote, it's this mandala type shape and an evil eye pointing outward. Around it, it says Ankhora and Parna, which means still learning. For me, it's about reclaiming that part of my body so that I didn't have to look at myself naked and see Keith's initials. I see something that I want, that I've placed on myself, end quote. To follow the still learning meaning behind the tattoo sign, of course, as I mentioned earlier, she did write a book titled Still Learning. When asked about Keith's sentence and what she thought was a proper one, her response was, quote, I don't think he is able to repair himself. I think he is somebody who is a danger to society. And if he is let out, I believe that he'll do exactly the same thing that he's always done, end quote. India wanted him to be sentenced to life in prison. Of course, this interview was before his sentencing because he did receive 120 years in prison, spoiler alert, but going over the trial and sentencing for everyone will be in the last part of this series. It looks like one of the ways that India has been able to cope is with humor. And I can totally understand this because I cope with dark humor with certain parts of my life. So I, I get it. I really, I get it. She did have to work through her intimacy issues with others because of Nexium. After a long enough period of time for her, she met a sous chef named Patrick in New York. India was reluctant at first because she wasn't sure what his true intentions were. Did he want to get to know her as India or who she was being made out to be in the media as just the cult girl as they have called her? Patrick didn't really bring up Nexium or her past life within the cult. India and Patrick are happily engaged as of August 2020. She has two foster cats named Beans and Rice, and she keeps in contact with some of the people that she met in Nexium, but these are people who are very against Nexium, just like India. Along with eventually, she said that she wanted to have children one day. She once said that she hopes she will be a good mom and quote, but my God, if I get a daughter, I think it would be a very interesting karmic experience for me to have a daughter to feel a little bit of what my mom has felt three times over, end quote. She isn't looking to be famous for her time in Nexium, but what she does want is to be part of things that truly matter. These include documentaries about women's issues, high control groups, coercion, or other types of subjects that coincide with these. I really wish India all the best, especially after everything she's been through and everything she's endured, both during her time in Nexium and post Nexium. And the same goes for Sarah Edmondson as well. Before we move on, I wanted to quickly touch base on something very briefly when it comes to therapist or licensed psychologist and Nexium. Therapist or licensed psychologist weren't allowed to come to Nexium trainings as per Sarah Edmondson. Life coaches or consultants weren't allowed either, unless the top people of Nexium interviewed them and let them participate in the group programs. Keith said that they weren't allowed because his self-improvement methods were so helpful, so original, that he believed the psychologists would steal them and claim them as their own. As I've said, 
multiple times in this series, Keith Rainier has one of the biggest egos I've ever seen in my life. In my opinion, this could have been one of two things. Either because his ego was so big and quite possibly one of the biggest egos on the face of this planet that he was so full of himself, or he didn't want licensed professionals being there because he knew damn well that they would know something was up. These professionals could have easily contacted authorities afterwards and told them that something was happening within the group of Nexium. What I didn't know until researching Nexium a little further is that Sarah Edmondson's mother was a licensed therapist and her father was a counselor. Her mother saw right through Keith's bullshit and would try and talk to Sarah about it, but she didn't push too much because she didn't want to lose her daughter to a cult. Not to mention that Sarah's mother would be seen as a suppressive person if she didn't support Sarah or if she spoke ill of Nexium and Keith. There was some kind of therapy going on behind the doors of Nexium that was called EM or Exploration of Meaning, which of course Keith made up. This was set up more like a group therapy session rather than a one-on-one. -on -one. There would be a group of members in the, in the room while a member uh, and a high-ranking Nexium teacher would sit across from each other. The member would speak to the teacher about whatever was on their mind and the teacher would try to see if the anxiety was due to a memory or pattern from the person's past. Kelly Scott, a therapist, said, quote, I think there is a way that group absolutely fetishizes vulnerability. Actually, the more accurate way of saying that is they fetishize exploitation, end quote. With all of that being said, who else did Allison Mack try to recruit into DOS? This is going to be a very brief overview. There was a tweet on February 19th of 2016 where Allison Mack tweeted at Emma Watson and she said, I participate in a unique human development and women's movement I'd love to tell you about. As a fellow actress, I can relate. So dot, dot, dot. Emma Watson never replied. The next one was Kelly Clarkson. At Kelly Clarkson, I heard through the grapevine that you're a fan of Smallville. I'm a fan of yours as well. I'd love to chat sometime. This was on July 20th of 2013. Apparently, Allison had tried this tactic before, but Kelly Clarkson never responded. Then there's Beverly Mitchell, and according to Vanity Fair, it says, on Friday, Mitchell spoke with actress Christine Lackin on her podcast, The Worst Ever Podcast, and told the host that Matt contacted her to recruit her to a self-help group. She said Mac tried to get her to attend a seminar which Mitchell understood to be an empowerment seminar for women. Mitchell said she told Mac it was not for her, but she gifted the seminar to her friends who did not attend. First of all, I thought it was like an empowerment of women. I thought it was for someone who needed a confidence boost, she said. That is just a very, very small amount of the people that Allison Mac tried to recruit into Nexium and Honestly, I think that could be a video all on its own. So if you guys are interested in that, I can make that video, but I'll leave a few articles linked below in the description box if you wanna look into it a little further. If you remember from one of the earlier parts of this series, I spoke about how Allison Mack had married Nikki Klein. Well, as of late 2020, Allison had reportedly filed for divorce. Allison went to her first Nexium meeting in 2006, thanks to her co-star, Kristen Kirk, who became involved in the group. Allison started off by being introduced to Jeunesse. Lauren Salzman and Nancy Salzman were the ones who recruited Allison into this. Allison was invited to Albany to attend one of their volleyball games, which is something that I spoke about in part two. Afterwards, Allison decided to join and pay for these expensive courses. At the time of joining, there was already controversy surrounding Nexium. Barbara Bushi started to mentor Allison. Barbara would later leave Nexium in 2009, and Barbara is an ex-girlfriend of Keith. She has tried to steer clear of the public besides telling her story within Nexium. She joined Nexium in 2000, and while she was getting to know Keith, he gave her some details from his childhood. Barbara says, quote, Keith also told me that when he was 13 years old, he believes that's when he had what he deems his transformation of himself. That's when he believes he became enlightened and his last attachment to the outside world disappeared, end quote. Keith's father spoke with Barbara and told her how once he spoke about how Keith was a gifted child, that was a moment that Keith thought he was superior to everyone around him. 
Barbara talked about how she thought that her and Keith were in a monogamous relationship together until about a year down the line into their relationship. Keith manipulated Barbara just like many others and got her to allow him to have a commodities account under her name, where she claims to have lost around $1.6 million. Nexium had even falsely sued her for years thinking that she was some kind of spy for the media. After Barbara left in 2009, she was being harassed by Keith's followers. She became a whistleblower and contacted authorities about what was really going on within Nexium. For Barbara, once Keith's verdict was read, she felt a, quote, feeling of freedom and safety. To me, it's a new day to live unencumbered by the threat of what he might do next, end quote. Now that you know a little bit about Barbara, let's get back into Allison. As Allison went through these courses, she was under The Source, which was some kind of special course specifically for actors. For more than a decade, Allison would recruit people. Rick Ross has said in the past that Allison was almost like the Tom Cruise of Nexium. It's scary how much Nexium is being compared to Scientology, and Scientology still exists today. Remember how we spoke about Allison's co-star Kristen Kirk? Kristen left in 2013, and once more news broke out about Nexium, there was speculation that she too was involved in DOS. Kristen decided to address these accusations and said the following on Twitter. When I was about 23, I took an executive success programs slash Nexium intensive, what I understood to be a self-help or personal growth course that helped me handle my previous shyness, which is why I continued with the program. I left about five years ago and had minimal contact with those who were still involved. The accusations that I was in the inner circle or recruited women as sex slaves are blatantly false. During my time, I never experienced any illegal or nefarious activity. I'm horrified and disgusted by what has come out about DOS. Thank you to all of the brave women who have come forward to share their stories and expose DOS. I can't even imagine how difficult this has been for you. I'm deeply disturbed and embarrassed to have been associated with Nexium. I hope that the investigation leads to justice for all of those affected. If you remember from part one, I did talk about how Sarah Edmondson did vouch for Kristen when this came out. DOS was Keith's idea, but Allison helped continue this group. Just like Nexium, DOS was a pyramid scheme. Oprah Mag said that Nexium and DOS both had the structure of a classic pyramid scheme. As I said, Allison filed for divorce from Nikki Klein and Nikki never faced any criminal charges in Nexium. She's reportedly still an active supporter of Keats. So much so that Nikki, along with others, held daily dance parties outside of the prison that Keith was in. So what does the Dalai Lama have to do with Nexium? It was May 6th of 2009 when the Dalai Lama came to Albany. This was to speak about compassionate ethics. The Dalai Lama was speaking at the World Ethical Foundations Consortium Conference, which had 3,000 Nexium member attendees. High-ranking Nexium members even went on stage with him. The Dalai Lama put a ceremonial Tibetan scarf, the kata, around Keith's neck. Sarah Brofman was one person who helped the Dalai Lama speak at the event. Some may have thought that the Dalai Lama endorsed Nexium. However, at the time, the news of Nexium being a cult wasn't really known. Some of the first whistleblowers who spoke out against Nexium were actually at this conference where the Dalai Lama spoke. Claire Brofman at one point even flew out to beg him to come speak at this conference. Some reports have said that he was allegedly paid $1 million to speak again, while others say he never took any payment. I haven't seen evidence that the Dalai Lama took this payment, but I also can't stop any speculation that may occur. So you guys can form your own opinion on that, but I really don't think that the Dalai Lama would endorse Nexium, especially after all of the information that has come out since.
Today, I'm gonna go over the downfall and the aftermath of Nexium. I truly believe that if it wasn't for the ex Nexium members and survivors telling their stories and being a voice, not only for themselves, but those who couldn't speak out regardless of what their reasoning was, they don't have to give a reason, which is something I wanted to add. But Nexium might have still been operating today if it wasn't for these stories, these testimonials. It takes a lot of courage to speak out and be vulnerable to the public and media because both of those can be ruthless and judgmental. Before I get into who was charged, what their sentences were, I wanted to provide you some more documentaries and content to consume if you'd like to learn more about Nexium, or if there's something that I didn't cover or something that goes a little bit more in depth on something that I covered in this series. I did speak on a few of these types of things throughout the series, but in case you didn't watch the other parts, because there are a lot of parts to the series, as I already said, I wanted to share them all in one video. If any of you have any more content to share regarding Nexium, whether it be documentaries, podcasts, books, what, whatever you want to add, if you want to leave some recommendations, leave them in the comment section below. I know that if you leave links, I, I would ask you to leave links. I know that sometimes when that happens, YouTube will flag that and put that into my held for review comment box comment section box thing, whatever you want to call it, but sometimes it'll put it in held for review. So I'm going to be monitoring the comment section for this video. So in case something does get popped into held for review, I will approve it and let it go through. So as I said, if you have anything that you want to add, any other content to watch, just leave it in the comment section below. But let's get into some more content that you guys can watch, listen to, read, whatever you prefer to do. The documentaries that I wanted to share are The Lost Women of Nexium, which goes over the women that I spoke about in part three of this series, The Vow. This was released just last year in 2020, and it goes over the experiences of Nexium survivors that has been renewed for a second season, Seduced Inside the Nexium Cult. This documentary features India Oxenberg's story, and from some comments I've received throughout this series, it seems like that is a good documentary to watch. One commenter even said that it was better than The Vow. Beyond the Headlines, Escaping the Nexium Cult with Gretchen Carlson. I haven't heard too much about this one, but in the one article, it did say it's a lifetime production and it focuses on Catherine Oxenberg's story and her fight to save India, which is her daughter, from the cult. The next portion is going to be podcasts. The first one is Uncover Escaping Nexium, A Little Culty by Sarah Edmondson. One podcast episode that I will leave linked below as well is from a channel called Roberta Glass True Crime. And this was recommended by one of you. In this very same podcast episode by Roberta, she interviewed an ex Nexium member, Susan Dones, who spoke about how she had suspicions about Kristen Snyder's death, along with having a tape where Keith spoke about how he's been able to have people killed. However, I did not hear the tape for myself. This is just what was said by the person who was being interviewed. Susan talked about her involvement with Nexium, and towards the end of the podcast, she said that too many people are focusing on Keith, that Nancy abused people too, which I think is fair to say given she was in it and she was very close to Nancy. This was sent to me when I was already almost finished with the last portion of my research for this part of the series, which is why I'm just going to leave it below for you guys to listen to rather than tell the story because it's a very interesting podcast to listen to. There's a lot of twists and turns, so I just recommend listening to that podcast. Then we have books about Nexium. Scarred, the true story of how I escaped Nexium, the cult that bound my life by Nexium survivor Sarah Edmondson, Still Learning, which is by Nexium survivor India Oxenberg, The Program Inside the Mind of Keith Rainier and the Rise and Fall of Nexium by investigative journalist Chet Hardin and Nexium survivor Tony Natalie, Captive, A Mother's Crusade to Save Her Daughter from a Terrifying Cult by Nexium survivor India Oxenberg's mother, Catherine Oxenberg, and New York Times bestselling author Natasha Stoyanoff. 
Then there's a few extra little tidbits of information if you're interested. If you want to learn more about cults, then you can go ahead and check out Rick Allen Ross or Stephen Hassan. These are great people to speak on this topic along with taking a look at the bite model by Stephen Hassan, which can be found online. It's very readily available to you. Speaking of some extra content to watch regarding Nexium, let's chat about how there was an email campaign that was trying to delay the vow. What's not very surprising to me is the controversy that broke out about the vow being released. Well, it, okay, it's not really controversy. It was more so Nexium members being upset about this and starting an email campaign to prevent the series from premiering on HBO, allegedly. The name of the documentary did come from DOS, which is one of these secret societies that I spoke about throughout this entire series, but more so in part four and part five. The Val was a nickname for DOS, and if you haven't been following along, it involved branding and sex trafficking. To be a part of this group, you had to provide collateral, or what I would call, in other words, blackmail. You had to give the masters nudes along with other things that are personal and private so that you would actually keep the secret of DOS. Well, that was according to the masters. In my opinion, I do think that it was blackmail so that you just wouldn't speak out against this subgroup of Nexium. Sarah Edmondson even said that she had to fabricate footage about her husband abusing her and her son, even though that wasn't true. Because the vow showed images and clips of some seminars that Nexium members attended, those members have now alleged that this violates their privacy, so they were asking for these clips to be removed. Now, I'm kind of tossing up how I feel about this, because it could be one of two things. It could be that this has nothing to do with how these members feel about this violating their privacy and everything to do with the members just not wanting information out there in the open about Nexium if they're still current members or if they still, I guess you could say, uh, support what Nexium is all about or support Keith Rainier. The Times Union did have a copy of the email that was sent from the members and a portion of the email says, quote, I did not and do not issue consent for my likeness to be used for commercial purposes and therefore I do not consent for HBO to use footage of me for any reason without my written permission, end quote. Clearly that email didn't scare HBO from releasing The Vow. They actually, as I said earlier, renewed it for our second season back in October of 2020. The only other thing that I could think of is that the media twisted this narrative and these people, in fact, didn't want to be featured or shown and they're currently deprogramming from Nexium. I'm going to, in good faith, hope that HBO and whoever's behind all of that that they did look into these people and did look to see if they are currently deprogramming from Nexium and that they really truly aren't having their privacy violated. I'm leaning more towards the first one that I was talking about, about how these people could possibly still be supporting Nexium and Keith Rainier because I just, I don't think that a documentary that is so focused on the victims from what I've read and from what I've heard because I haven't watched it myself, but I just don't think that they would broadcast something if other victims were really upset about it. But I, I, I could be wrong, I could be wrong. But how did Nexium come crumbling down? In 2017, there was a Times article that came out about Keith Rainier and Nexium. Former Nexium members and victims spoke about what Keith had done to them. After this was published, Keith actually fled to Mexico. And on January 18th, 2018, a search warrant was issued for Keith's email account. Then in February of 2018, a complaint was issued in federal court requesting an arrest warrant. I guess Keith thought he was gonna try to get away with this, but it wasn't too long after that complaint was issued that Keith was captured. In March of 2018, Mexican authorities found Keith in a villa outside Puerto Vallarta, Later on, Lauren Salzman would say that the arrest interfered with an alleged planned group sex session. When police arrived, Lauren and Keith had barricaded themselves inside of the master suite. The Mexican federal police deported him back to the United States. 
Keith was charged with sex trafficking, conspiracy for sex trafficking, and conspiracy to commit forced labor. He pled not guilty. In July of 2018, Keith, along with several others, were indicted on other charges including racketeering, identity theft, and extortion. On May 7, 2019, Keith's federal trial began. Prosecution witnesses included Lauren Salzman, Mark Vicente, victims identified as, and they put these names in quotes, so I'm assuming it's probably they're just giving them, uh, they're, they're, they're just trying to keep them anonymous, but Sylvia, Daniela, and Nicole, along with Rick Ross. On June 19th, 2019, it took a jury less than five hours to find Keith guilty on all charges. These included sexual exploitation of a child and possession of child. The word that starts with a P and ends in pornography, because I don't really want to get flagged all that much here on YouTube, but with regard to a victim who was a minor. Sex trafficking of another victim and attempt sex trafficking of yet another victim. Identity theft against Edgar Brofman, Yapez Loperfido, I don't know if I'm saying that properly, Ashana Chinoa, Mariana, and Pam Caffritz. Trafficking for labor and services of Daniela and forced labor of Nicole. Conspiracy to alter records for use in an official proceeding. And then on October 27th of 2020, a federal judge by the name of Nicholas Garafis sentenced Keith to 120 years in prison and fined him $1.75 million. As of January of this year, 2021, Keith started his 120 year sentence at the United States Penitentiary Lewisburg, which is a maximum security penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. On January 22nd of 2021, he was transferred to the United States Penitentiary Tucson, which is in Tucson, Arizona. Keith is right where he belongs, in my opinion. On April 20th, 2018, Allison Mack was arrested in Brooklyn by the FBI. She was charged with sex trafficking, sex trafficking conspiracy, and forced labor conspiracy. The prosecution allegedly also accused Allison of a sham marriage with Nikki Klein, only to help Nikki with the U.S. immigration laws. On April 24, 2018, Allison was released on a $5 million bond and was held under house arrest under the custody of her parents in California. Allison was charged with recruiting women into DOS as well. On April 8th of 2019, Allison Mack pleaded guilty to racketeering, conspiracy, and racketeering charges and was scheduled for sentencing in September of 2019. As per E, Allison said, quote, Through it all, I believed Keith Rainier's intentions were to help people. I was wrong. I must take full responsibility for my conduct, and that is why I'm pleading guilty today. I am and will be a better person as a result of this, end quote. Her sentencing has been postponed to give the court sufficient time to conduct pre-sentencing investigations. At the time of filming this video, Allison Mack still hasn't been sentenced. However, it's reported that she can be facing a maximum of 40 years in prison. Nancy Salzman, who was the prefect in Keith's number two, having a gold sash, which I went over in part two of this series, pled guilty in March of 2019 to charges of conspiracy racketeering under the jurisdiction of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Along with that, Nancy was found guilty of obstructing justice in a civil suit between Nexium and a former student by editing and removing portions of session videos to favor the appearance of the company. According to the New York Post, Nancy said, quote, I want you to know I am pleading guilty because I am, in fact, guilty. I accept that some of the things I did were not just wrong, but sometimes criminal. I justified them by saying that what we were doing was for the greater good. I still believe that some of what we did was good, end quote. Nancy is still awaiting sentencing. The general consensus that I've been getting from a lot of people that were in Nexium, a lot of people that have spoken out, they did believe that they were doing something good. Nancy's daughter, Lauren Salzman, is awaiting sentencing after pleading guilty to conspiracy charges in March of 2019. In May of 2019, Lauren spoke about the day when she tried to hide Keith in the villa that they were in in Mexico. She said, quote, it never occurred to me that I would choose Keith and Keith would choose Keith, end quote. 
I'm not shocked that Keith would choose himself and expect his followers to protect him at all costs. It's sad that it took all of this and so much time for some of these people to realize that. Don't get me wrong, they did terrible things and should do the time for the crime, but I can't help but wonder, if it wasn't for Keith, would they have ever done something like this? Judging by what some of these women have said so far within this video, I'm starting to believe that Keith loved the control that he had and he was well aware of what he was doing, allegedly, in my opinion. Or he was so disturbed that he believed in all of this, but I'm leaning more towards him being well aware of his actions. Claire Brothman, who as mentioned in previous videos, is the heiress to the Seagram fortune along with her sister Sarah. Both Claire and Sarah were involved with Nexium. Claire was arrested by federal agents on July 24th, 2018 in New York City, charged with money laundering and identity theft. She pleaded not guilty in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York in Brooklyn. Claire was released on a hundred million dollar bail and placed under house arrest with monitoring. On April 19th, 2019, Claire pleaded guilty to conspiracy to conceal and harbor illegal aliens for financial gain and fraudulent use of identification. I know there are going to be people in the comment section saying that it's undocumented immigrants and not illegal aliens, but I just wanted to say that I'm going by what some articles have written. In addition, I'm not 100% sure, but I do think that that is the terminology that they use in court. However, correct me if I am wrong in the comments section. Without a plea deal, there was a possibility that she could have faced up to 25 years, but with the plea deal on September 30th, 2020, she was sentenced to six years, nine months in prison. In addition, she was fined $500,000 in order to pay restitution to one of the victims in the amount of $96,605. What infuriates me just a tad is a week after her sentencing, her lawyers asked for her to be freed from the detention center while she appeals her sentence. This was because her lawyers said that the prosecution had asked for only five years. With that, Claire also had a liver condition that meant she was at a higher risk for contracting COVID. In the end, they came to an agreement that she could serve her sentence at a minimum security facility. There was a class action lawsuit filed against Sarah in 2018 in the Brooklyn Supreme Court. This lawsuit was asserting that Sarah tricked Isabella Martinez and Gabriel Leal, among others, to be part of these classes that were part of a fraudulent scheme nationwide. In part four, I spoke about some of these secret societies along with talking about Rainbow Cultural Garden, which was for children to be able to learn other different languages. And Sarah, along with her husband, founded the Athal Education Group, which was kind of like a rainbow facility in the UK. What I didn't find until my research for this part, which is after I had already filmed and edited part four, was that authorities did close the school in 2020. On January 28th, 2020, Sarah and Claire Brofman were named as defendants when 80 victims sued Nexium due to sex trafficking and forced labor. Someone that I haven't mentioned in this series yet is Kathy Russell. Kathy was Nexium's accountant for more than a decade. In April of 2019, she pled guilty to visa fraud after she knowingly presented false documentation to the consulate in Mexico just to bring a Nexium member into the United States. In May of 2019, Kathy had requested that she can relocate to Georgia because she couldn't find a job. I mean, it's kind of obvious why. She had family in Georgia and she wanted to go there to get back on her feet. The federal judge did sign off on this relocation and at the time she was allowed to move without an ankle monitor. As of a New York Post article dated January 21st, 2020, sentencing for Kathy has been indefinitely pushed back. Her lawyers had asked to push it back to April 21st while they wait for the probation department to issue a recommendation for Kathy's sentence. She could get up to 10 years in prison for this charge, but she could also get six months to a year. One article said that prior to pleading, Kathy used her Fifth Amendment right more than 80 times when she went before a grand jury so that she wouldn't incriminate herself. So I guess the final question is, what exactly happened to Nexium as a whole? 
It's unknown, but there has been speculation. While the website no longer exists, there is an archive version from before it was taken down that said, quote, it is with deep sadness that we inform you we are suspending all Nexium ESP enrollment, curriculum and events until further notice. While we are disappointed by the interruption of our operations, we believe it is warranted by the extraordinary circumstances facing the company at this time. We continue to believe in the value and importance of our work and look forward to resuming our efforts when these allegations are resolved, end quote. Some have speculated, and I'm going to speculate the same, that Nexium isn't truly gone. There are still Keith and Nexium supporters out there. The part of the series before this one, I spoke about Nikki Klein and how she and others were dancing outside of the prison where Keith was. After that, I did a little more digging into this, and according to the Times Union, these dance parties or organizations, whatever you wish to call it, went under the name We Are As You and the Forgotten Ones on the website. Some of the people who were dancing claim this was to lift the spirits of the prisoners and they really didn't make mention of Nexium. Nikki spoke about how she had a friend, Keith Rainier, inside and how she doesn't even know what a sex cult is. So my name is Eduardo Asuncelo and I'm one of the founders of uh, The Forgotten Ones. We come and we dance for the people inside of MDC Brooklyn. Because of COVID, they, have ha they haven't had visits in like six months almost. July 3rd was the first day that we came. Um, so it's been, I guess, almost 20 days in a row, every day, eight to nine. Uh, and from inside, we get reports that the morale is up, that there's less violence, that they have something to uh, look forward to, which seems to be really, really good for them. Uh, my friend in there is Keith, Keith Ranieri. I was a teacher in Nexium for 10 years, um, which, you know, that's why we didn't want to, at first to say who we were because we knew it was going to be done, it was going to be made about these things. We have a friend who is incarcerated here. He's been here since March 2018. As you do with people that you've known for a long time, you have inside jokes. And one of my party tricks is doing a moonwalk. So I did a moonwalk and a bunch of guys started banging on their windows. Um, so we we're like, oh, that, that's probably fun for them to see. It's probably not every day that they, that they see that. And um, it, it evolved to, to turning on the car stereo and dancing and like shining our lights and waving. You know, I took classes for, for many years with executive success programs, which is uh, affiliated with Nexium. I think what's really sad is that we are out here doing something really good um, that is helping a lot of people. And people can't get past this idea that we were in something called a sex cult, which I don't even know what that is. I certainly was never part of a sex cult. Mark Vicente believes that this is just a Trojan horse, that this movement or organization is just a cover up for Keith's followers. Some of the well-known people of these organizations, and I use that term loosely, dancing outside the prison are high-ranking Nexium officials that still believe in Keith. Those are people like Danielle Roberts, who was a doctor that allegedly branded 13 women, Nikki Klein, a high-ranking DOS member, and Eduardo Asunsolo, who was a high-ranking Nexium member that also supported Keith in court. You can form your own opinions on that, but I do believe Nexium is still alive, but maybe operating more secretively than ever before. I think this The Forgotten Ones organization was started by Nexium members for Keith, and because other people started to join in, the Nexium members were okay with it because it would disguise what they were actually doing. That's just my theory though, I can be completely wrong, but there's still Keith and Nexium supporters out there, which terrifies me. I mean, there's people out there who support people like Chris Watts and Ted Bundy, so that terrifies me too. That concludes this series, well, at least for now, until the sentencing happens for everybody else. I will make an updated video about the sentencing in the future. And depending on if I find more information or not, I might add it to the series, but for now, this has come to a close. And I want to say that if it wasn't for the courage 
of those who spoke out and their experience in Nexium, the victim stories, these people may not have been charged, at least maybe not yet. And I know that I said this in the beginning of this video, but I did wanna just reiterate that because some people can be really vicious when it comes to ex-cult members, but we need to remember that these victims are broken down and built back up the way that the cult sees fit. Victims who spoke out against the cult deserve empathy because it's not easy telling a traumatic story. Put yourself in their shoes. You are promised an amazing women empowerment group, for example, like Janesse and Doss, something you've been looking for because you're at a vulnerable part in your life. Then you join and get indoctrinated into this disturbing world. There are some who are afraid or maybe even ashamed or embarrassed to tell their stories but I don't think we should shame the victims, even though we may not understand why they did what they did. All right, everyone, if you have watched up to here, thank you so much for watching. I know it was a very, very long one. I'm sure there's gonna be people that have to come back to it because like I said, it is a very long one. And if you are not familiar with my channel or the fact that I have been putting these Nexium series or topic type videos into their own playlist. So if there is something that you prefer to show someone in regards to a specific topic, each of these videos will have their own video in the playlist that will also be linked below. I know I've said video and playlist and series and all of that plenty of times in this video. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys next time. And this is Monica reporting to you live from a highway. Bye.